Some of you might remember the battle for Uncle Larry's money. For those of you who don't, I'm going to replay the prior three hearings because no matter how many times I watch them, I still just am, I'm fascinated and I'm dumbfounded all at the same time. Make a will, people, and make sure the people in your will are alive. If they die, update your will. Right? You got it? We're good? Okay. If you don't want to rewatch the hearings, then I'm putting the numbers on the screen. That is how far you need to fast forward to. If you are watching this live, then turn it off and come back in that amount of time plus now. You have to math. Sorry. Here we go. Oh, and I got crazy backstory for you at some point. So real quick, before we get into the actual case, let's talk about when you die without a will in test date. The there are statutes in almost every state that says what happens to your assets, what happens to your stuff, you know, who's going to get that $3 worth of change that's, you know, buried in my couch because that's about all I'm worth these days. So generally things pass to your children or your parents. After that, it's going to be your grandchildren, brothers and sisters, maybe grandparents. So nieces and nephews would be after grandchildren, children, brothers and sisters, parents, grandparents, and they'd be in line with great grandparents and aunts and uncles, if that makes sense. So now that you know that, let's look at their family tree real quick, because this is where it gets a little wonky. So Ma and Pa had three boys. And then Ma had another boy with someone somehow, somewhere. I didn't get into all that. So Larry, who is who we're looking at, he had two kids. His brother, Dennis, had one child. And then the half brother, you know, Ma's kid, but not Pa's kid, had a daughter. But that daughter was possibly never legitimized. So there, there's no definitive proof that she's really his daughter. They weren't married. She was born out of wedlock. There was no, you know, they say legitimized. It's such a crappy word, but basically you got to go through the court system, put it on the birth certificate and pay child support. I don't know. So when Larry wrote out his will, this is Larry's will. He left everything to his parents. So he wanted mom and pa to have it all. They were living with him at the time. He wanted them to have everything. Now, he wrote this will out back in 1999. He wrote in the will, I understand I have two children. I do not want to leave them anything. Like, point blank, you get nothing. Not a, sorry, nothing. All three of Larry's brothers passed away before him, as did his parents. He has disinherited his children so what that leaves is his grandchildren, his niece, and his possible half-niece, maybe? It, yeah. So those are the people. This is, this is our cast of characters. So hopefully that will help you understand this. This is in the District Court of Butler County, Kansas, case entitled, In the Matter of the Estate of Larry Franklin Holderman, Deceased. It is case number 2022, PR 168. Uh, the court uh, finds that Weta appears, uh, attorney for the estate. Uh, Mr. Cranmer, would you make announces, uh, announcements, please, regarding appearances? Yes, Your Honor. Douglas Cranmer and Sam Natera of Stinson Lass Wilson on behalf of Frank Blunt, Esme Pearl. Um, Sam and I are appearing via Zoom video from my conference room. Frank and Esme are appearing via Zoom video from, I believe, in the state of Washington. And you can see their pictures on the Zoom video. All right, Ms. Williams? Yes, Joy K. Williams. Uh, I am accompanied by my client, Susan Davenport. We're appearing via Zoom. Mr. Mills? Your Honor, Russell Mills appearing on behalf of uh, my client, Mandy Holderman, uh, uh, a uh, heir and issue of the deceased. She is present in my conference room with me. Okay, Mr. Mills, uh, can you tilt your screen just a little bit? I, I can just barely see your heads. There you go. Oh, okay. 
Thank Sorry you. About that. I appreciate that adjustment. Okay. There appear to be no other appearances on the meeting. We will begin. This matter is set for further proceedings after the board had conducted a previous hearing where uh, construction of the will was extensively discussed. I will note, as I'm sure the attorneys are aware, that Mr. Mills uh, made a very uh, belated filing yesterday of an interpretation of will and application of anti-lapse. I'd like to introduce you to a new segment called Penny Explains. So we all know sometimes dogs are smart as a whip, other times they're dumb as a box of rocks. Reddit might explain it like I'm five, but here we're gonna explain it like we're a dog. So here, for the first time, Penny's going to explain the Kansas anti-lap statute, which is actually really simple, but comes across as really confusing. So Kansas statute 59-615, also known as the anti-lap statute, reads, devise or bequest to spouse or relative who predeceases the testator, issue, defined. If a devise or bequest is made to a spouse or any other relative by lineal descent or within sixth degree, whether blood or by adoption, and such spouse or relative dies before the testator, leaving issue who survive, the testator, such issue shall take the same estate which devisee or legatee would have taken if he or she had survived, unless a different disposition is made or required by will. It's further broken down in the annotations as anti-lap statute in effect at testator's death applicable in action to determine whether heirs of deceased beneficiaries succeed in his interest in re-estate of Thompson, which is still really confusing. So let Penny break it down for you. Okay, so let me give you a scenario. When we went to adopt Roxy, her littermate Lola would not shut up, crying, screaming, having a fit because we took her sister away. So we ended up with two. They were inseparable for about a week. Then we get home and Lola disses Roxy for Rambo. Now her and Rambo are obsessed with each other. Her and Rambo have a love-hate relationship. He beats the crap out of her in the morning and then loves on her in the evening. It's like an abusive relationship. It's really bizarre. Anyways, so Rambo has his favorite toy, Ducky. So he writes out his will and leaves his favorite toy, Ducky, to his girl, Lola. But Lola's scared of everything and um, ends up having a heart attack when someone looks at her and she's gone before Rambo. Lola doesn't have a will. So everything she has passes on to her sister Lola, except like a dog, except Rambo's toy ducky. Because per the rules of the anti-lap statute, items can't pass collaterally. They have to go lineally. Lineally means up and down. Collaterally means across a generation line. So say during her, you know, week at the pound, Lola hooked up with Stray, had a kitten. Rambo doesn't know about this kitten, doesn't even know it exists. However, this kitten is getting Rambo's ducky toy because of the rules of the anti-lap statute. What it means is that the inheritance automatically passes down to a person's descendant, whether it's specifically stated in the will or not, unless it is specifically stated otherwise. Hopefully that explains it just a little bit. I don't know. The title, I trust each attorney is now familiar with Mr. Mill's recent submission. Uh, we, were, we are here to discuss the status of this matter and for the court to make uh, some ultimate rulings in the case. I want to give each attorney an opportunity to at least make a summary statement of their current position in the matter. Uh, I will start uh, with Mr. Mills. Your Honor, uh, I, I apologize for the uh, delay in getting my uh, response or, uh, to your request completed, uh, I will tell the court that I spent a great deal of time trying to uh, comply with the court's request, which, uh, as I understood it. And so the document that I have filed is pretty much sets out uh, the law and the facts as I understand them. Now, Your Honor, I, I want to make sure that the court uh, uh, understands that the facts that my client has provided to me are facts that are essentially from her family uh, history, uh, and I don't want to mislead the court in any way. Uh, but it's our understanding, or her, I should say, her understanding that uh, the children, uh, Frank Bly and Esme uh, Pearl, were adopted uh, by a, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Bly. And so in the first part of my uh, uh, 
written presentation to the court, I kind of go through uh, that and how that might affect these proceedings. And uh, if we can confirm uh, through Mr. Bly that he was in fact adopted, I mean, this makes sense to me if he goes by Mr. Bly, that someone named Mr. Bly did in fact, you know, adopt him. Uh, that being the case, Your Honor, uh, we believe that the the law of uh, the state of Washington uh, would uh, impact this case greatly uh, as it relates to the adoption. I don't and, quite uh, see how, Mr. Mills. Uh, this is a Kansas drafted will that's being probated in Kansas. So why should this court look to law of the state of Washington here? I, I noticed that in your well, recent submission that if Kansas law didn't appear to be on your side, you cited Arkansas law or Washington law or some other state's law, perhaps to avoid the implications of Kansas law, I would suggest. Um, well, my Washington. Uh, Your Honor, I, I guess I, the, main, the main thing that I think we have to keep in mind, Your Honor, is that, you know, the, the, the Kansas law, even, uh, even uh, in interpretation of the wills, we're supposed to determine what the intent of the testator and even under the anti-lab statute, that's that's there for the purpose of helping to uh, us or focusing us, uh, focusing us on, again, the intent of the testator. And so what I'm trying to advise the court of is if if you look at the the statutes, you know, you you can't on the one hand say, well, he should be aware of the Kansas law, but not be aware of the Washington law that terminated uh, these children as, as his children and further terminated those children as having any right to inherit from him. So, so uh, you know, that was something that he would have known and would have taken into consideration when, uh, you know, when he was involved in this, this, this will here. I think, I think that if that's the case, I don't think the Kansas court can determine that these children or even their grandchildren were in fact uh, issue uh, of, of my client's uh, father, excuse me, of, of Esme Pearl and Frank Bly's father, or uh, the, the grandchildren uh, of uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Larry Holderman, uh, or issue either for the purposes of the anti lapse statute. So, uh, you know, we, if we're given full faith and credit to the order, the orders that were entered in the state of Washington to the adoption, then that just, just takes them out. Uh, so that's kind of my position on that, Your Honor. Uh, and but it but it further goes to the intent of of uh, uh, Larry Holderman, the testator, as to whether or not he wanted to include these people, and and the facts that I were was given by my client, or the I should say that the history uh, is that Mr. Holderman, after the adoption, uh, never saw. Well, I should say, as I set out in my in my pleading. Uh, only saw Frank Bly one time in his life after the adoption and only saw Esme Pearl twice in his life after the adoption and only saw the grandchildren uh, that were born at that time uh, once during his entire life. So when you take that type of information into you know, looking at well, what was what was his and what was the testator's intent? I think that that uh, is information is very important for the court because the court, under the case law that, that I've presented here, uh, says that the court in in interpreting these the the will needs to place itself in the position of the of the testator as as closely as as it can. So in order to do that, the court needs to know. You know, you know what the kind of the family uh, uh, dynamic was at that time, and so uh, I I felt that the case law that I've provided 
does point the court, you know, in that direction. And once you once you do that, Your Honor, uh, then you can you can look at look at the facts and easily, in my opinion, determine that Mr. Holderman's intent was to disinherit his uh, his children, which is absolutely uh, set out uh, in the will. I mean, there's just absolutely no other way to interpret uh, the will. Let's, let's um, talk about that for a second, Mr. Mills. If okay. earlier you were arguing that he was relying on Washington law that would apparently, under their statutes, uh, automatically disinherit adopted children, then why did he mention them specifically in, in his Kansas will? You know, Your Honor, I think I mean, if, if he was question. relying on it, he wouldn't consider them at all, would he? No, and here's here's what I'm saying, Judge. This is a this is a very good point that I I think you're making, and I think I have the answer, because, Your Honor, I think all of the attorneys uh, were not aware of this situation, uh, and certainly I wasn't. I I and I can't speak for the other attorneys, but uh, I was not aware of this adoption until I just you know, got to looking at Mr. Bly's uh, name, and I kept thinking, why in the world is his last name Bly? So I called my client, and then that's when, for the first time, I I figured out about this, this adoption, and I wanted to bring that information to the court. I think that maybe what happened was when, when Mr. Bly went to have the will uh, signed, uh, the attorney said, well, do you have any children? And he may have said, well, I had some, some children out in, in uh, Washington. Uh, and maybe he didn't tell them that they were uh, adopted, just as we've had a kind of a, a problem here with getting that information to, to all counsel. So I, you know, I can see where I, I know if I was, uh, had heard something like that, I'd say, well, let's just make sure we inherit, disinherit them anyway, just to kind of cover all bases. And so I think that's probably what happened there. And I think the fact that we've, you know, been involved in this situation for quite some time, this place for some time, and no one brought up the fact that these children were adopted kind of speaks to that very you know, issue. All right. So, uh, Mr. Mills, um, as a, let me let me ask you this question first. Your client, uh, Mandolin Holderman, is not mentioned as a beneficiary under this will. Would you agree? I would agree, Your Honor. So why is she entitled? Why is she entitled to anything under this will if she's not specific? Well, well, I think I think what you have to do, Your Honor, is you have to look back. At, at the facts and and understand where Mr. Holderman uh, was in, in his life and, and what had happened. Okay, you put know, that aside. Had, put that aside, Mr. Mills. Uh, I don't need an exploration of what he might have been thinking about. I just want to know as a matter of law, why are you taking a position that your client's entitled to anything under this will? Anti-lab statute, Your Honor. Fifty-nine, six, fifteen. Clear. Yes, clearly says, he is. Which says what? Summarize it for me. What does it say? It basically says, Your Honor, that when a relative who is the named uh, beneficiary or, or uh, devisee, or uh, when they are named in the will to receive, and they predecease uh, the testator, uh, but they leave. Uh, surviving uh, issue, then in that event, those surviving issue will take what the uh, deceased beneficiary would have taken. And so there's no dispute that my client uh, is a uh, issue of these uh, grandparents. And so she would take what the beneficiaries who were deceased would have taken. And so right. there's no question about that. All right. The question, 
Okay. I'll go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mills. I, I appreciate the summary explanation of the Can Kansas anti lapse statute. We'll be getting back to that. So, did uh, you have any other presentation or argument that you wish to make at this time? Well, Your Honor, uh, I would just refer the court back to my to my brief that I think well, it's not brief, but I mean my my pleading uh, that I think goes through the law pretty pretty clearly. And, and I will say I understand it, that the court and counsel uh, got it uh, maybe a little bit untimely, but. Uh, uh, it, it certainly uh, has, it, I did the best that I could to get the law to the court, and uh, I think if the court reviews it, uh, it will have uh, the law that it needs to reach its determination. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Mr. Cranman. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I did receive Mr. Mills pleading, however, I, I think it was filed around noon or so yesterday. What they keep referring to about Mr. Mills filing is back on 7-7 when their prior hearing took place, apparently Judge Rickey ordered Mr. Mills to write something up regarding the anti-lap statute and how it applied in this case. And he did not submit it until yesterday middle of the day, which meant most of the attorneys did not get it till last night. It was a multi-page filing with quite a few citations and a lot of information compiled into it. So obviously they haven't had time to fully review it to prepare any kind of answer for it. So they're all a little upset that they received this at the last minute when he had um, a month and a half at least to prepare it. I had court yesterday afternoon, so unfortunately I didn't get it forwarded out to my uh, clients until last evening um they have told me this morning and they had sent me an email i haven't spoken to them that they were not adopted it is true that mr holder and the decedent and the uh frank and pearl's mother were divorced and, and she remarried to a man named mr Bly. i can't remember his name um I'm an, I am told, and I asked my clients about this when the case first started, why was his name Bly? And that's when they explained to me that their mom had remarried to a man named Mr. Bly and they had done a name change. And they specifically indicated at that time that it was not an adoption, it was a name change. And they reiterated that via email to me this morning that they were not adopted. This was a, some sort of a name change action that took place up in Washington State not an adoption. Um, Mr. Under Kansas law, is that a difference that makes a difference? Or I don't think it does make a adopted difference. Adopted children still entitled to inherit from a natural parent in Kansas? In Kansas, I believe they are. And that was kind of where I was leading into. I mean, the next Mr. Mills pleading then goes into talking about Alabama law and Arkansas law and things like that. Well, I don't believe that's the law of the state of Kansas. I believe an, an adoption does not cut off the right to inherit unless it specifically says so. And again, I didn't have a chance to look at that the law up on that due to the, the late my late receipt of uh, Mr. Mills' pleading. So I really don't think it makes a difference, but I just wanted the court to know that it's my understanding from my clients that they were not adopted. They just had a name change, and that's it. Um so I, and I will just highly summarize um, our position, Judge, and of course I would welcome any questions you might have. Um, but it's it's I think the case of Estate of Strobel, six Canap second nine fifty five. It's a nineteen eighty one case, and the Kansas Supreme Court denied review of that in on January twentieth of nineteen eighty two. The struggle case facts and the facts of this case are, are nearly identical. To say the two cases is identical is a huge stretch, in my opinion. However, he doesn't really give you any background on the Strobel case, so let me tell you what it's about really quick because it's really interesting. So Miss Strobel was a Kansas woman back in 1978. She had kicked her husband out, was in the process of getting a divorce. She moved her mom in and her mom was living with her. She did what she was supposed to do. She revised her will. She said, I want to leave everything to my mother as long as she survives me by 30 days. And I don't want my husband to get anything. Somehow, she left her car running in the garage of the home that she shared with her mother. Both her and her mother died of asphyxiation and carbon monoxide poisoning. This is where a legal battle ensued over her will. 
her husband thought he was entitled to everything and there were there was no backup beneficiary listed there were two provisions of her will that caused an issue it was the her mother had to survive her by 30 days and her specifically eliminating her husband this basically eliminated any of the family heirs from inheriting her estate to overly simplify the conclusion she basically wasn't able to exclude her husband from her inheriting in her will because she didn't have anyone else to leave her property to um in that case um the strobel attempted to disinherit a relative in that case it was her husband in this case the decedent attempted to disinherit his children frank and pearl in strobel the intended beneficiary who was in that case a decedent's mother um, did not survive the decedent. Well, the same thing happened here. In this case, the intended beneficiaries, who were the decedent's parents, predeceased the defendant. So in the Strobel case, there was the will did not contain a residuary clause. In this case, the will did not contain a residuary clause. Um, in Strobel, it was found that a decedent cannot disinherit his heirs by words alone. So in order to dis disinherit his heirs, the property must be given to somebody else. And it wasn't. There was no residuary clause. That was it. That's the same thing that's happened here. The property um, has not been given to anybody. The gift away from the purported disinherited people has not been completed. And that was found to be uh, not a good uh, disinheritance. In Strobel, it was found that where a bequest lapses because of the death of the beneficiary prior to the death of the decedent, and there's no residuary clause in the will, the property subject to the lapse bequest passes under the laws of descent distribution as intestate property. And we believe that's exactly what the court should find in this case. It's exactly the same thing. And therefore, the anti-lapse statute does not apply to property that passes via intestate succession or under the laws of descent and distribution. Um, okay, Mr. Kramer, let me stop you there. What precondition did Franklin and Clara, the, the primary beneficiaries under this will, what condition did they fail to meet? They didn't, well, it's implied that they need to survive the decedent in order to be able to take his under the will. But isn't that exactly where the Kansas anti-lapse statute is intended to step in? But Strobel, under Strobel, under Strobel. it would seem to the court that Strobel's different in that in that case, the primary beneficiaries had to meet a condition, which was a survival condition. That that language does not exist in this will. Doesn't that make Strobel factually distinguishable from this current case? You say they're exactly the same, or you're suggesting they're exactly the same, but the reason why there was a lapse in Strobel is because the precondition wasn't met. There was no precondition here. And while it's true that Franklin and Clara didn't survive the testator in this case, that's not an unusual situation. The legislature's contemplated it and passed a statute that steps in, does it not, and say, well, if there's any lineal descendants, there's no lapse. Isn't that true? But again, I think that's a distinction without a difference because I think the implied condition is that they have to survive the decedent in order to take under his or her will. Well, if that's true, then the anti-lapse statute has no meaning at all. Well, it goes and by- Mr. Mills has consistently argued from the beginning here. I think that it, it under Strobel, the, it, it, the, the, give, the will failed. So therefore the anti-lapse statute okay. never- All right, so, so let me ask you, how did the will fail here? Yes, the, the testator in this case, for whatever reason, left his estate to some people much older than him. It's certainly possible that somebody older than you isn't going to survive you, but that those individuals that received the uh, benefits of this will left issue. So isn't that exactly a, a Kansas anti-lapse statute situation? But because the gift was 
not completed. In other words, there is no residuary clause to, to, to apply. It passes outside the will through intestate succession. That's why I say the NLAP statute does not apply in this case. All right. I'll, All right. Uh, I'll okay. All right. And if that's if that's the case, then who would be the beneficiaries of this will, or who who would receive this estate? Is the better question. Who would who uh, would be the ultimate beneficiaries of this estate if the court accepts your argument, Mr. Cran? It would be my clients, Frank Bly and Esme Pearl. Okay. And that was the same way it was in Strobel. And the other case I'm relying on is NRA Estate of Hainburg. And that's 270 Kansas 365. And again, that's another case. It's not, there was, was not an attempt to disinherit anybody, um, but there was no residuary clause in the will or the codicil to the will um, and give to an heir lapse in that case. And it was deemed to pass under the laws of intestate succession, not under the NLAP statute under NLAPS. All right. Those are the two cases, and I, I would point out that the two cases I'm relying on, for the most part, are more recent cases than any case that um, anybody else in this case is relying on, and, and they still remain good law in, in Kansas. I think the court's pretty familiar with the rest of my arguments from last time, so I just wanted to summarize everything for you. If Thank you. you, you concise if you questions, Your Honor, okay, I, well, I understand you. your position today. Uh, Ms. Williams, what position do you take here? Yes, Your Honor. I did a great deal of case research, and my understanding of the question that the court was contemplating was basically if, when applying the anti lap statute, if we could do a generation skip and skip over uh, Frank and Esme Pearl, who otherwise would have been beneficiaries but were disinherited. I can tell you there is no case law out there. As far as I can tell, nothing in Kansas nothing in any other state, uh, just simply nothing on point. What I did start realizing as I'm researching, there is a definite theme, and that is a disinherited person can inherit through intestacy. If intestacy ap applies to a situation, uh, then that's when the disinherited person can come back in. But where the anti lap statute is being applied, I saw nothing where they were able to skip a generation over a disinherited generation and go to their issue. So I very much disagree with Mr. Cranmer's um, interpretation of Strobel. I think his interpretation would do away with the anti lap statute altogether. This is not a case where intestacy law should be applied, it's an anti lap statute. Um, my client and Mr. Mills's client would be the grandchildren of the two original beneficiaries, since neither of those. Is, is that are, conclusive at this point, factually? Not. Uh, do you have it, documentation? It is still a disputed fact that we're going to have to take up, Your Honor. Uh, and I don't know if you want me to get into that now, because that's a whole nother conversation of where we are on that. No, not particularly. because Okay. Getting... Yes, but that is something that we're still working on. Yes, but we believe that my client will be one of two heirs. I don't believe that just because the two original beneficiaries are deceased, that somehow we can apply the law to bring in those two disinherited grandchildren, uh, Frank and Pearl. Uh, to get to their children, you'd have to generation skip, and there is nothing that I can find in any case law or statute uh, Kansas or otherwise, that would allow for that. And that is the distinction I started realizing that I was seeing that I couldn't find a fat pattern such as the one before us. But all the fat patterns where a disinherited person was brought back in was under the laws of intestacy. So I think that is a significant uh, distinction. I think also where you have the anti lapse and where you have disinherited folks, uh, the testator's intention has to be supreme. Now, I don't know if they were, uh, if Frank and Pearl were actually adopted or not in the state of Washington. That obviously makes a difference. If they were adopted, though, I do think, even though this is a Kansas case, the Washington statute under which they were adopted says that, unlike Kansas, you don't inherit from your biological family once that happens. And I think that law would dictate 
if they were heirs or not, if they were considered legal relatives of Mr. Holderman anymore. However, it sounds like that is in dispute. Even if they were not adopted, I still don't believe under anti-lapse that they can come back in to the um, in, into the will as beneficiaries because they were clearly disinherited, which is allowable. And I believe Mr. Holderman did exactly what he had to do to disinherit them. Uh, so I don't believe we can revive uh, their standing. And I think because we can't revive their standing and there are two other people in line to um, inherit that we can generation skip and then bring in the uh, great grandchildren uh, to in inherit. So that is, I think, what I, I believe is that we have to apply the anti-lapse statute. And so it comes down to Mr. Mill's client and I believe to my client at the end of the day. All right. Thank you, Ms. Williams. You're welcome, sir. Mr. Weta, do you take any position here on the will construction issues before it? Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, it's difficult for us to take a position at, at this point. We have uh, my, my client has a fiduciary duty um, to the beneficiaries. Um, and right now we're trying to figure out the beneficiaries. Um, um, I, I will say that um, I, I, I think that there's been a lot of case law put here today. I spent some time with Mr. Uh, Mills's submission from yesterday. Um, and and um, I would I would beg to differ with his characterization that it pretty clearly lays out the law. Um, I, I don't think there was anything clear about the pleading. It was remarkably difficult to get through um, um, because it was a mixture of both law and fact. Um, and they call them uncontroverted facts. And I don't believe that those facts are uncontroverted in any way, shape or form. Um, and I think he admitted that today on the record when he rolled back his um, um, and, and said that it was family history instead of uncontroverted facts. Um, to that end, Your Honor, um, our, our position remains that we will do what the court tells us is um, is required to do. Um, we do think that the court should um, um, apply 59615. We do believe that um, this situation does apply to that circumstance. We disagree. Um, my my personal interpretation. Um, of the statutory language um, disagrees with um, the others who um, are asking to um, apply 59615. Uh, 59615 specifically states that if someone um, if someone qualifies um, to receive the gift and predeceases and leaves issue, that that issue should take, and that um, the issue um, of the individuals who were given there are um, at least, to the best of our knowledge, um, the four individuals that are put here um, in front of you, Frank, Esme, um, Joy's client, and uh, Mr. Mills's clients. Um, uh, we think realistically that the grandchildren shouldn't take, um, but um, we, um, if the court were to interpret the statute um, to say that the disinheritance requested in the will um, still requires that Frank and Esme be um, disinherited, then we, I, I believe our position is still that um, looking at testator's intent, to, um, he did not make mention of any grandchildren or any issue of those two individuals in his disinheritance. And therefore, those we, we, the court cannot presume his intention. The court can only um, determine his intention from what was put down in the will itself. Um, and so to that end, that is our position. But at the end of the day, um, my client is not a beneficiary of this um, estate um, and frankly just wants to ensure that she is complying with her fiduciary duties to all of the beneficiaries um, going forward. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, concise statement of position, Mr. Weta. Of course, prepared to rule on issues in this case at this time. And I do appreciate the time and effort by all the attorneys involved in this case to make their positions clear. This has been at least an interesting and fascinating uh, exercise in the law for this court. For anyone who might be watching YouTube today and essentially participating in the public viewing of this public case, court wants to go over some 
basics in this case. The decedent, the, the person whose will is at issue here, is a fellow by the name of Larry Franklin Holderman. Larry Franklin Holderman did a will, I think in 1999, that contained a specific provision that he's leaving his estate to his parents, Franklin and Clara. In the third paragraph of that will, he makes it quite clear in the view of the court by stating, I am aware that I have two children, namely Terry Robertson, also referred to here as Esme Pearl, and Frank Bly, and it is my will that neither child inherit under my will. As might be expected, uh, when a, a interest in an estate is left to persons older than the person making the will, Frank and Clara both predeceased Larry. In other words, his parents died before he did. There is no residuary clause under the will. There's no contingent beneficiary. Quite frankly, if I had been uh, advising that client, I would have tried to advise them that it would be important that if you're gonna leave your primary estate to people older than you, especially a generation older than you, that you name contingent beneficiaries. But that wasn't done here. Uh, so the, the persons who were to receive under the will and the only persons that are specifically named were Frank and Clara. They both predeceased Larry. So what happens now? Well, what happens now in the view of the court is application of the Kansas anti-lap statute, which has been referred to liberally during the course of this proceeding. This is a law passed by the legislature of the state of Kansas to prevent people from being declared intestate. In other words, it's to give effect to wills even when a primary beneficiary passes away. Kansas's law is just relatively simple and says, well, then their descendants, their lineal descendants will take their place without its being stated in a will, by operation of law, the anti-lap statute applies. Uh, the court rules at this time that Mr. Cranmer's arguments regarding the in-ray estate of Strobel are not applicable to this case. Strobel is legally and factually distinguishable. In Strobel, the beneficiaries in that case had to meet a precondition before anybody took under that will. In other words, they had to survive the testator, as the court recalls, by 30 days. And they didn't do that in that case. Therefore, since they, the primary beneficiaries, would have never received anything under the will, no one under them would receive under that will either. Therefore, the Kansas anti-lap statute did not apply in that instance. And the, the property passed through a testate succession. The will lapsed in the, in the Strobel case. Uh, there is a quote, and a very appropriate quote, that Mr. Mills put in his brief that I'm going to repeat at this point. This was from the estate of Russell, uh, a 1975 case. And I'll try to go slow. In construing a will, courts must, A, arrive at the intention of the testator from an examination of the whole instrument, if consistent with rules of law, giving every single provision thereof a practical operative effect. B, uphold it if possible. C, avoid any interpretation resulting in, in intestacy when possible. D, give supreme importance to the intention of the testator. And E, where the language found in such instrument is clearly and unequivocally expressed, determine the intent and purpose of the testator without resort to rules of judicial construction applicable to the interpretation of an instrument which is uncertain, indefinite, and ambiguous in its terms. This will can be upheld by the assistance of the Kansas Anti-Lap Statute, which is intended to apply in this situation. The court can give meaning and effect to all of this will's terms. In essence, what happened here is that the, the uh, will left the property to Franklin and Clara, Larry's parents. They died first. The anti-lapse statute then comes into play 
And the question then becomes, is there any person who was issued a Frank and Clara who survives, who can step into Frank and Clara's shoes? Well, the answer is clearly yes. Uh, Mandolin is a grandchild of Frank and Clara, the uh, child of Dennis, which was a child of Frank and Clara. So she's a granddaughter. So clearly, clearly, there is surviving issue. So this is not a will that lapses because there's nobody to leave it to. The Kansas Anti-Lap Statutes intends that Mandolin steps into Frank and Clara's shoes. So the will can be carried out. Susan Davenport, if she can appropriately show paternity or parentage in this case, that she is linked to uh, Frank and Clara as a, what would be a granddaughter in this instance, would also share in this estate. That is not clear. The court makes no ruling on that particular issue. Then the issue becomes, what about the children of Larry, which would be uh, grandchildren of Frank and Clara. That would be Terry, Asma Pearl, wh whatever name we give her. She's one of those children. Frank is the other. To give effect to all provisions of the will, the court must look at the fact that Frank and Pearl were specifically, clearly, and unequivocally disinherited in this will. This court will not ignore the obvious intent of the testator which took those two out. I am aware that I have two children, namely Terry Robertson and Frank Bly, and it is my will that neither child inherit under my will. He couldn't be more clear about their disinheritance. It is the ruling of the court that they do not come back in as a result of the anti-lap statute, that the, to give effect to the will and its provisions, they are specifically disinherited because the will calls for that. And the anti-lap statute makes it clear that if it's, that the court has to still follow specific provisions of the will when it comes to application of the anti-lap statute. So the court rules that Pearl and Frank are out. However, this court also has to find that the language used in the will makes no mention of the issue or lineal descendants of Terry, Ezra Pearl, or Frank. And the court finds that it would have been really simple to add language to make that clear. For example, to state that my children and their issue are disinherited. My children and their lineal descendants are disinherited. My children and my grandchildren are specifically disinherited, but no such language appears. Mr. Mills would have this court simply imply that those are parts of the will. They are not, those, those words are not there. This court cannot read them in. A language of disinheritance must be specific and clear as to the individual's disinheritance. There is no clarity in this will that there was any intention to take out the, what well, the court would deem as innocent beneficiaries or innocent heirs who are not specifically disinherited. It does appear to the court that Pearl has four children. Am I right? Four? Victoria, Claire, Isaac, and Stuart? That is correct, Your Honor. Four children. Uh, the court rules that those four would take what would otherwise be an appropriate share of this estate. Now, Victoria, Claire, Isaac, and Stewart are not grandchildren. This court views uh, Frank and Pearl's disinheritance as legally dead. They are construed by this court to be uh, predeceased when the court applies the anti lapse statute. I hate to use the term folks, but I think that I, it, it helps illustrate what happens in a situation like this, if indeed uh, Pearl and Frank are legally dead, their children aren't. These children are not specifically disinherited. Therefore, they would take, uh, the four children of Pearl would take and split their mother's share 
that she would have had had she legally lived, which would be a granddaughter's share of one, either one half or one third, depending on what comes out on the Susan Davenport situation. So it would be the court's ruling then that the children of Pearl are not specifically disinherited and that they do take under the Kansas anti lap statutes as lineal descendants, not of, not essentially of their parent, but of their great grandparents, Frank and Clara. They haven't lost their status as great grandchildren of the beneficiaries of this will. Frank and Clara. So uh, I believe that the, the court's pronouncements this morning resolve most, if not all, issues in this case. The court directs the estate's attorney to carry out the court's ruling in regards to disposition of this particular estate. We still have a very important issue regarding the parentage of Susan Davenport. Uh, obviously, um, as things, if she is excluded, Mandolin would receive one half of this estate. Uh, Victoria, Claire, Isaac, and Stewart, 12.5% in the view of the court. If Susan Davenport's included, then uh, Mandolin would receive one third, Susan one third, and then the other kids would receive one twelfth of this estate. Mr. Mills. This court specifically rejects your argument that they have to file any type of claim or assert any type of uh, entry into this proceeding to receive. Either they are beneficiaries under the will or they're not. Now, it very well may be appropriate for a number of reasons for them to disclaim their interest in this estate, but that's a, that has to be a voluntary act on their part. The, the state, a state's attorney would be directed to contact them and uh, I suppose inquire as to what their intentions are regarding receipt or non-receipt of part of this estate. I suspect I know what their answer will be, but uh, I think that's up to them. And obviously uh, that would affect an ultimate outcome uh, depending on what decisions they make. Mr. Wedd, I'm curious, do you have viable addresses for each of these four? Um, yeah, we, we believe that we do. We have sent them um, um, notice of this hearing as well as notice of prior hearings. And uh, my client is present um, with me in my office and says that she believes that she has accurate addresses. All right. And we will confirm that before we send it to If there needs to be an inquiry, I would sure she should be able to provide each of her, her children's current addresses, I would hope. Um, all right. So let me address Ms. Williams at this point. We have an ongoing issue, and it's an important one as to whether your client even shares in this estate or not. This court would have to have proof provided to it, unless there's a concession, which I've never understood that there is, that she is one of the children that would receive. She would be the child of John Kennan, which is Clara Holderman's son. And she has to prove that. And I I got an impression from Mr. Mills' submission that the adoption records were inconclusive. Actually, the adoption records were very interesting, Judge. Uh, basically, we obtained the adoption file and we obtained my client's pre-adoption birth certificate. In the adoption, they state that the father is unknown. They give no notice. They don't publish anything. but Back then, they would have a social worker, uh, looked like maybe a, an SRS social worker, do a, a little investigation, a little bit write-up. And for some reason, this unknown person, they had a birth year and they, they knew his uh, occupation was that of a jockey in Eureka. So then we go to the uh, birth certificate where the father's information should be, and this is the pre-adoption birth certificate, you would assume that there'd be no name or the word unknown or someone's name. It wasn't any of those three. It said not unknown, not unknown. So this gives credence to what my client had always been told was that there were a couple of things going on. Uh, her mother, her biological mother's family 
was rather embarrassed by this situation, felt like the biological father's family was of a different social class. And there was some embarrassment of that. And uh, number two, there was an age difference. Uh, the mother was uh, 17, the biological father was 21, and there were some threats that if he was named father, a bit came out that he they might try to pursue getting him thrown into jail. So I think clearly they knew who the father was, but uh, they did the shell game of pretending he didn't exist. Uh, clearly they, they knew who he was. I have been working through trying to go from the least intrusive, least expensive ways of showing my clients paternity up to the more uh, intrusive, more costly ways. I believe Mr. Weta's client accepts my client as an heir. Uh, there is all kinds of family evidence and including Mr. Mills's client has known my client since 1989, has met her several times, has called her cousin, but now doesn't uh, once this has come up. Uh, there are pictures, my client was in the obituary. She is listed on the headstone as the daughter of Mr. Kennan. I realize that that is not DNA evidence. The local- Okay, let me ask, who, who made the decisions to include her? in an obituary on a headstone. Who, who made those calls? I can tell you, Mr. Holderman, Frank Holderman, and Mr. Kennan's mother, the grandmother, the paternal, biological paternal grandmother. Clara? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, we've got pictures of the headstone listing her as daughter, the obituary listing her as daughter. Mr. Kennan acknowledged her as daughter. Uh, we have pictures of the family, I mean, Everyone accepted that she was Mr. Kennan's daughter, including Mr. Kennan and Mr. Kennan's mother, who was an original heir to this will. Well, uh, apparently not everyone has accepted well, that. Well, not everyone. Uh, Ms. Holderman is now uh, not accepting that. So basically, I then I have looked at local like utility consultants and their DNA. Uh, do you want me to get into this at this time, Judge? Well, your, your presentation has been excellent, and I understand now that you have a good faith factual basis to make oh, this. Oh, absolutely. Point. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it does appear that there may need to be a trial on the merits on this issue if it's contested. I, I trust that you're going to provide any and all documentary evidence to the other attorneys involved in this case, uh, particularly Mr. Weta, Mr. Mills. I'm absolutely. Sure exactly what interest Mr. Cranmer is going to have after today. Uh, but obviously, if he asks for that information to be shared with him, I will require it. Uh, and then if the parties are unable to reach an agreement uh, on that issue, then it'll need to be set for trial, frankly, okay. where the burden of proof would be on you and your client to prove that she is a lineal descendant of uh, Frank or Clara. And you're... In well, yes, I, I think you're right. We're, we're exploring the DNA possibilities, which starts getting us into the weeds a little bit. We can address that later. But yes, Judge, we're we are working through the steps, trying to go from least to most intrusive to try to figure this out. Like exhuming a body. Yes, Judge, that is what I'm I'm getting to. Yes. There's no other known source of DNA. Yes, there is. Uh, uh, and that's why I didn't know if you wanted me to continue. Uh, let me tell you that first I tried like utility consultants, a local agency that does DNA testing. Their tests are aimed to determine paternity. Therefore, they are not the most sensitive of tests. So if we had the putative father or the putative father's brother, something like that, we could use that. But in this case, all of that generation is deceased. We have like a great uncle, we, we may have a great aunt, we may have a cousin. Uh, so that's part of our problem. So then I think it comes down to either we use a site, a professional site such as Ancestry.com or one of those type sites that has a much more sensitive test that can genetically link you with even your fourth cousins. And we accept that. Or we start exhuming a body. And I, I, I hate to go there, but that would be the possibility that we exhume Mr. Kennan. Uh, Mr. Holderman, the, the gentleman whose will we've been dealing with was cremated. My understanding is cremains can be tested. However, 
it is unlikely that they will give us a good result unless there's a great deal of bone marrow that survived the process. So it's unlikely that that would be a good source. So either we agree on a, um, a commercial testing site, like I have described, or we look at exhuming Mr. Kennan. I've been trying to avoid that eventuality, Judge. Mr. Weta, I presume that the estate's inventory has been filed in this case? Um, yes, I believe it has, Your Honor. Um, I was trying to look at the financial viability of yeah, um, what been I, discussed, and I see, I see that there are substantial assets in this estate. And yeah, and and if I if I may interject, I I don't mean to to throw too much on. Um, I I think Joy has done an excellent job of presenting her client's case at this point. Um, but it is my understanding from our construction of the family tree that Mr. Kennan is related to Clara only. Yes. Um, and I do think that that will um, change our um, mathematics if she is, if if she is indeed um, a beneficiary, um, given that she would only be entitled to half of the estate that would go to Clara um, through the uh, chapter through chapter fifty nine six fifteen, um, as she was not a lineal descendant of Franklin. So I, I do think that it would slightly change the mathematics. Um, but um, I think we can get to that point um, if her client is able to show the evidence necessary to uh, in, either by agreement or by trial, Your Honor. And of course, I encourage the, the family to reach a family settlement agreement on these issues, if at all possible. Uh, but further discussions need to be held based on today's rulings of the court uh, regarding the contested issues which are currently before it. Um, so from here, Ms. Williams, how much time do you need? I, I think that Mr. Weto at some point would like to close this estate. I trust claim period is run, uh, that the case might otherwise be in a position for final settlement if we can get these issues resolved. So what are you proposing here, Ms. Williams? If we agree on using a commercial uh, DNA website, um, I it would take a few weeks to get the results back, but it would be, I would say, six weeks, six to eight weeks. Uh, if we are talking about exhuming Mr. Kennan, then that um, we would have to get the proper order to do that, exhume him. But then once we get the sample, it's a matter of getting it tested. I think maybe one of the more local testing sites could do it at that point because then it's a paternity uh, test, uh, not trying to connect more far-flung relatives to each other. Um, but we're talking a matter of probably a couple months. All right, coordination of this many attorneys is problematic. So while I have everybody on this meeting, I'm gonna have my assistant propose a date for status review. Um, I'll allow an hour for this hearing if there's some relatively quick and concise issue that the court can resolve, perhaps I can do it on that date. But I wanna at least review the status. I don't want this case just to float off without any deadlines or court review. I'm looking at the last week of October, Mandy. Can you propose a date for an hour setting in the last week of October? And then we'll see if we can get it coordinated. We are open the 30th. All right, October 30, Council? Yes. That works for me, Your Honor. Your Honor, I don't, as you noted, I don't know how much involvement I'll have, but I have a trial down in Winfield on the 30th. Okay. Um, court has made a final ruling regarding your clients and your clients' interests. Um, if your trial goes off, I certainly invite your participation, but I think I'm going to go ahead, if that works for all the other attorneys, I think I'm going to go ahead and set it there. Uh, certainly, if you need to have a, an attorney substitute just to the to weigh in on what the status of the case is, that's certainly appropriate, Mr. Kramer. But I'm going to go ahead and look for a date on the 30th. That that's okay. fine, Judge. I just wanted to let you know, and I can probably have Sam or, or somebody cover for me on on that. I don't think I can take any action with regard to an appeal anyway until the whole case has been resolved. 
I'll need to research that and I'll need to talk to my clients, but. Okay, did, did I get clearance from Mills and, and Jordan yes, Williams? Your Honor, and Mr. The 30th, Your Honor, the 30th is, uh, is good for me. Okay, Mr. Wetter. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Did you say what time on the 30th? I was going to propose 10 a.m. That's fine for me. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I have a standing court appointment on Monday mornings. I'm usually not done until 11 or 11.30. So I don't know that I can make 10 o'clock work. I'm sorry. Are you free up in the afternoon then? Later in the afternoon, I could do probably a 3.30 or a 4. Okay. 4 o'clock work for you, Mr. Mills? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Weta? I'm available, Your Honor. Thank you. October 30, 4 o'clock p.m., the court will set a status review. I'm going to primarily be reviewing uh, the issue of parentage uh, of... Uh, Ms. Williams' client at that time, October 30th, 4 o'clock. Your Honor, is that, that's just a status conference, is that correct? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Perhaps it'll be an announcement of the settlement that's been reached by the family in this case. Certainly agreeable with the court if that's what it's used for. October 30, 4 o'clock p.m., status review. Uh, I'm not necessarily interested, Mr. Weta, in determining all proportions because that's that's undecided for any number of reasons. But if the, the basic rulings that were made here today, I'm going to assign you the responsibility of drafting it. Uh, you are essentially more or less a neutral party. As the attorney for the estate, I'm going to task you with, with drafting uh, an order stemming from today regarding the various rulings that have been made by the court today. If you'll just circulate that among all counsel. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wenner. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, so some reference to exact proportions that the heirs would receive under this order is yet to be determined or something along those lines would be adequate. All right. Uh, Mr. Cranmer, anything further we need to address today? I have nothing further for today, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Williams, anything further at this time? No, Your Honor. Mr. Mills? No, Your Honor. Okay. And Mr. Webb? Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Very well. Thank you all for your involvement yeah. and the quality of your submissions to the court and arguments made here today. If there's nothing further, the Holderman matter will currently be in recess. And Manny, you may end this meeting for all at this time. Trent Weta appears as counsel for the uh, personal representative of the estate. Doug Cranmer appears. Uh, who are all of your clients at this stage, Mr. Cranmer? I still represent Frank Bly and Terry Robertson, who goes by Esme Pearl. All right. Mr. Mills, uh, I take that you still represent uh, Mandolin Holderman, is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. All right. And Ms. Williams, you're still representing Susan Davenport. Is that correct? That is correct, Judge, and she is with me today. All right. Mr. Weta, I'm going to start with you. I, I did receive from you a an order, which I think is submitted under Rule 170, uh, that you drafted stemming from the August 22nd proceedings that we we had. It appears to be consistent with the court's notes in all material respects. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you just a brief summary of, of what I ruled on that date. Uh, the will can be upheld. Court will enforce the disinheritance clause. Anti-lapse statute triggered. Mandolin Holderman and possibly Susan Davenport take from the parent beneficiaries named in the will. But Pearl's children, and I put four in parentheses, also received from the great-grandparents, Susan Davenport's familiar heritage, a disputed issue to be determined, status hearing set for October 30th at 4 o'clock p.m. to review Susan's heritage status and to schedule further trial on issue as is necessary. Trent Weta to draft journal entry with proportions of the estate and the shares to be determined later. Now, Mr. Weta's order appears to be uh, consistent with my notes in all material respects. I'm a little curious why I don't 
have signatures from all the attorneys. What's the problem here, Mr. Weta? Um, Your Honor, um, I, I submitted that order. Um, I, I did also attempt to, um, I hope it came through in fax filing. I'm, I'm going to be honest. It's been since the very beginning of my career since I fax filed something. But um, um, I did submit alongside the uh, Rule 170 notice um, objections that were put forth by Mr. Mills. Um, I believe Ms. Williams also um, had a, uh, a slight objection, but we addressed all of that in the second draft. Um, um, all of those documents are there in front of you um, just out of an abundance of um, making sure that the court had everything that was in front of it. But frankly, I believe the only outstanding objection um, was from Mr. Mills. Um, and so I did submit that order, um, Rule 170, um, at, at that point for the court to determine today. Okay, I know some of you are stubborn and didn't go back and watch the original. So real quick, Larry Holderman is right there on the second line over to the left. He's the one who was deceased. He left his entire estate to his parents up at the top who are also deceased. And then the next people in line to inherit his estate would be his three brothers who were also deceased. He didn't update his will, even though they died all before him. His two children, he specifically disinherited from his will. One of his children has four children. So the argument was, would the grandchildren inherit from his estate? And the answer was no. However, the grandchildren would be direct decedents, inheritance heirs from his parents who inherited from him. So the inheritance would jump over to the grandparents. Then it would go down to their children, which there aren't any. Then it would go down to their children's children, which would be the two nieces and his two children, which were disinherited, then their share would go down to the grandchildren. So the two nieces and the grandchildren. Well, the one niece, Mandolin, thinks she should get everything, and that's who Mr. Mills represents, and that's where this whole argument is coming from, is he is challenging everything because Mandolin thinks she should get the entire estate, which is valued at, I think, um, three-quarters of a million dollars, last I checked. Mr. Mills, the court's inclined to approve it in its current form. Your position on that? Your Honor, uh, I the only thing that I wanted to make absolutely clear is that my objections to the portions of your decision that you made were clear. And uh, I thought that it might be uh, better to uh, state something to the effect that you entered this order and that I objected there to, so it would be right in the order. All the other counsel believed that, hey, I'm, I'm worrying too much about that. It's already in uh, the transcript or, or in the record. And so they feel, and I, you know, they may be right, Your Honor. Uh, I, I just want to throw that out there. But I, out of an abundance of caution, I want to make sure that my, uh, I'm not foregoing any objection by going along with the order as written. That's all, that's all it really is. I'm not accusing anybody of not trying to follow your order, Your Honor. I'm just trying to be very careful in, in my asserting my objection. Well, your continuing objections are noted, but don't need to be chronicled in the journal entry stemming from August 22nd. I would agree with Mr. Weta's position in that regard. The court will approve the order in its current form. That should be on file later today, counsel. And I'm, I'm going to ask the clerk's office that when they get the chance, they're they're a little bit uh, overburdened at the moment, <laughs> dealing with paper filings and the like. But I, when they can, I'll have the probate clerk mail a copy of this signed order to each of you at the address stated in the order. All right, with, with that done, uh, I will move to the petition filed by Mr. Mills to deem request for admissions deemed admitted. Um, it's, it's relatively straightforward. Ms. Williams, I'm, I'm surprised that you didn't comply with the request for discovery in this case and didn't file a proper response within the time period allowed, at least according to Mr. Mills. Your explanation for that? No, actually, I did. I sent my answers to him and I sent a notice to the court that I had so submitted those answers. I was never informed by Mr. Mills that he was still waiting for the answers. Um, I sent to Ms. Stapleton today a copy um, 
of my email and my answers uh, that show on October 16th, I sent them to Russell Mills by email. And the first notice I had that Mr. Mills didn't get them was today when I got the email from Mr. Mills. I didn't know there was a problem. Had I been informed, I would have endeavored to get him another copy or fix whatever the issue was. But no, sir, we answered and we got them and I sent them to him. I was not aware that Mr. Mills didn't get them. And I'm not sure why Mr. Mills didn't get them because, I mean, you will see from my email that it was addressed to Mr. Mills. What date did you send it? October 16th, Your Honor. That was a Monday. Okay. I think the due date fell on uh, on the weekend. So yes. we got them out on Monday, but we, right. we got them out timely and they were answered. Um, I have resent them to Mr. Mills. Like I said, if Mr. Mills had picked up the phone and let me know, we could have cured this. But no, sir, we, we endeavored to answer these in a timely manner. All right. Well, I'm curious, Ms. Williams. Since it is relatively pertinent to the issue, primary issue we have left, how many of these proposed requests for admissions did, did your client deny? I uh, haven't counted, Your Honor. There were several that she she put don't know on. Um, she actually, well, she, she denied outright. one and there were several she put don't know on because she just simply didn't feel like she had the information one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen she put don't know uh because she wasn't positive of the answer one way or the other okay which one did she outright deny uh, number seven, uh, they were asking about an adoption and title matter of the person, their person of baby cons, a minor, uh, filed in 1968, um, if those records have been submitted to the court. Um, and so she denied that one. Uh, that was confusing question. All right. I think he's just asking whether the records from that adoption proceeding had been reviewed by you, Ms. Williams, but hadn't been filed as exhibits in the district court. Yeah. If they're talking about her adoption, that is correct. Uh, her adoption, uh, I think the probate, I'd have to look. I think it may have been 67, but it was confusing. But yes, I've reviewed those report, the, that file. That is tr true. So to the extent that that matters, yes, I, I have reviewed that file. I think we know that. I've been, talked about that before with the court. So, yes. Okay. All right. Your Honor, could I respond? Yes, Mr. Mills. Well, Your Honor, uh, the thing that I would like to point out, and I, I don't I mean to, to, to argue with the with counsel, uh, but as I recall, I had sent those out uh, to her on like September the 15th and she had 30 days to respond and October the 16th would be past the 15 days. Doesn't so, she get the benefit of, of the 30th day following on a weekend, Mr. Mills? Uh, well, I mean, I traditionally uh, don't work Sundays. Well, I doubt if you do, though there are times when all lawyers seem to be pressed into service on Sundays, but I think doesn't the Kansas Rules of Civil Procedure contemplate still that if the final day of a period falls on a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, it's the next business day in which they become due? And that's what she says she did. She sent them on that next business day, which would make them timely. I see what you're saying. Okay. Uh, I didn't receive them, Your Honor. That's, I, I wanted to tell you why I didn't receive them. I don't know, but I, I didn't. So uh, if that's a problem with the email, it's a problem with the email. But the other thing I'd like to say is, Your Honor, I'm not sure that you can enter a, a uh, I don't know answer uh, 
to a request for reduction. You can deny it and say why you deny it, uh, and then that's fair. But I don't think there's a basis to to allege a, a don't know. And since that's the case, then all those should be deemed admitted, in my opinion. Hmm. Well, Your Honor, I would suggest then we, we call them denied then because she was trying to give what she felt was an accurate answer to the request for admissions. They're certainly not admitted. So if we need to go back and do a supplemental response, we can and deny all of those. But we're not admitting them because she didn't feel like she had enough information to say for certain if they were yes or no, so. Which is a standard response under some limited circumstances. I suppose what's bothersome is that she did that with so many of these. Um, well, you, are, you have to look at some of the questions. He's He's asking her things that she doesn't really know. I mean, no co-workers of John Kennan have ever appeared and stated that John Kennan spoke of having a daughter. She doesn't know if any co-workers have ever talked of him having a daughter. Uh, Man Mandolin Holderman never heard John Kennan speak of having a daughter. She doesn't know what Mandolin Holderman heard or didn't hear, except if some of us the questions asked. Your Honor, if I could respond, it, the the point of many of these requests for admissions is to determine what she knows regarding the answer. And if she doesn't know, then that means she's not going to be presenting any evidence in that regard, it appears to me. And if that's what they're saying, then I'm okay with those answers. Begging the question, Mr. Mills, even if all of this were to be admitted, where would that leave us? Well, that would leave us with a uh, inability for, uh, which I don't think they have anyway, but uh, would leave them with an inability to establish uh, any uh, basis for uh, establishing the child to be meaning Susan Holderman to be a child of uh, the, the deceased uh, John uh, Kennan. And that's because she cannot establish that he notoriously uh, uh, had, that there's any evidence to establish that he notoriously recognized the child as his. And well, therefore right. cannot. Okay. That is a pertinent point, Mr. Mills. And, and I think it, it may go toward whether there's any statutory presumption. The Kansas statute regarding the presumption of paternity is mentioned quite a bit during this hearing, but it's not discussed enough that you can actually define it. So just to give you a brief overview, a man is presumed to be the father of a child if the man's mother, the man and the mother are married before the child's born, attempt to marry before or after the child's born, get married after the child's born, or the man acknowledges the paternity of the child in writing um, the mother has the man's consent to put the name on the birth certificate. The man notoriously or in writing recognizes paternity of the child, including but not limited to a voluntary acknowledgement made in accordance with KSA 2012 supplement. Yeah. Genetic testing. But it has to have a probability of 97 percent or greater. And. The man has a duty to support the child under the order of support, regardless of whether the man has ever been married to the mother or not. And that is what is listed in the statute. So the two things that they're relying on is genetic testing, hopefully not, or the man notoriously or in writing recognizes the paternity of the child. However, that's really hard. You got to find something that shows that defined notoriously because the man's dead of paternity here it wouldn't appear to the court that there is right i'm not sure that's ever even been asserted by ms davenport that there's one of the statutory presumptions of paternity which apply in this case i think her position all along has simply been i am a biological daughter well and uh, without without any of the statutory presumptions being in place 
shifting, I think, the burden of proving paternity to her. Uh, essentially right. through probably the one conclusive way to determine it, and that would be genetic testing. Well, uh, There's also some other proof that could be provided, but it wouldn't establish a statutory presumption, I don't think. Do you disagree, Ms. Williams? Well, Your Honor, I'm wondering, I emailed my response to Mr. Mills' motion to or petition to dismiss my client's claim with a proffer of proof. And once again, I emailed that to Mr. Mills. I emailed that to other counsel and I sent a copy to Ms. Stapleton for your benefit. And I've, e I've mailed a copy to the court uh, for filing. In that, we respond to Mr. Mills's petition, citing the case law that is relevant. And we proffer the proof of people who can come in and testify that Mr. Kennan identified himself as Susan Davenport's father. And so we have that information here. And once again, that was sent to Mr. Mills and to everyone else by email. And I guess I'd ask everyone if they got it. If not, I could resend it. Mr. Wetter, did you receive this? I did receive it and I have reviewed it, Your Honor. Mr. Kramer, did you? I received it, Your Honor. Mr. Mills? Yes, I did, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. All right, Ms. Ms. Williams, what is your your what is the burden of proof here, the standard of proof? That would so apply to this. The standard of proof uh, when you have an illegitimate child uh, basically comes, if you look at the cases that actually Mr. Mills also quotes in his motion to dismiss, Meyer v. Rogers and the matter of the state of Lester case v. Dunlap. And it basically finds that um, a father can confer heirship or beneficiary ship in a, uh, for probate purposes on an illegitimate child by holding this person out as his child and that recognition of his paternity being notorious. And so these are the two cases that uh, basically tell us that that is the way that she, one of the ways other than our DNA, possible DNA evidence is to show uh, that she would be a beneficiary. So basically, if Mr. Kennan held her out as his child and that recognition was notorious, or in other words, well-known, then he can confer the heirship or the beneficiaryship onto her. And that is what those two cases say. And we basically are attempting to give a proper proof here showing that not only did he make these statements, but everyone in this orbit accepted it. And we've got several um, statements by family members and uh, people who have heard, and at least one friend of uh, Miss Kathleen Cox, which was her mother, uh, who heard these things and are familiar with those facts. Uh, we also then also included his, his uh, headstone and his obituary which I think once again goes to the notoriety of his acceptance of paternity. He never questioned it, never told anyone he questioned it. He told people he was her father. Everyone accepted this. It was notoriously known that he accepted that he was her father and accepted that paternity. So, Your Honor, I think just with that, we meet the, stat the burden of proof in our case law. Now we're also working on that DNA, which were, uh, which would also show that she's a biological child. But Your Honor, I think that what we've submitted to the court uh, is enough right here with this uh, response to Mr. Mills. I think Mr. Mills has also raised a statutory defense. I think he's alleging, I, I hope I'm paraphrasing this properly, that she, that your client's simply out of time under Kansas paternity law, understanding that mm -hmm. that the Kansas paternity statutes were passed after virtually all of this, these cases that you've cited were, were uh, promulgated from the courts. And so if we look at what the statute currently reads, that you're, you can bring in action at any time to determine the existence of a father and child relationship, which is presumed and if it's not presumed until three years after the child reaches the age of majority, with all due respect, I think your client is more than three years past the age of majority. 
Your Honor, I think that there are two different ways when you're talking about an illegitimate child who's been adopted by another family. Yes, if you had had the paternity uh, way uh, or paternity was established, et cetera, that would be proof of, of his paternity. But you can also establish it by him notoriously holding her out as his child and that paternity being notoriously recognized. And so I believe there's actually two different ways. And so, no, I don't think my client is out of time. I don't think she has to go in and try to sue him to uh, have some legal finding of paternity. I think that this, for probate purposes, is the other way that we can show it. Or a third way would be with uh, DNA evidence. So, no, I don't think she's out of time. I think it comes down is, is she a biological child or was she or has her beneficiary ship given to her by her father notoriously recognizing her as his child. So I disagree wholeheartedly with that analysis, Judge. I don't think going under the paternity statute is the only way when it comes to a probate case like this with an illegitimate child adopted by another family. Your Honor, could I respond? You may do so, Mr. Mills. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, the case law that, that I have cited and the council has just referenced uh, were cases where uh, I believe that the presumption uh, of paternity under uh, 23-2208 existed, okay? Uh, it, it doesn't here. And so I, I would assert that, you know, the, the court is correct in its analysis of just being too late. When you look at 59501, just the definition, it talks about, you know, who children can, what children can be deemed children, okay? Well, a child who is biological and has been recognized as a child, so like my children, I recognize them from birth, my, my name's on the birth certificate, uh, you know, there's no question that I'm saying they're my children. So, they are my biological children. Uh, uh, posthumous child, she wasn't a posthumous child. Uh, you know, and children whose parentage has been determined under the Kansas law, parentage law. Those are the ways that you can be determined to be a child of uh, the deceased. And none of those fit here. But, Your Honor, just for the sake of argument, I would be willing to go through these cases and explain to the court that if the court, and I'll try and just cut to the chase, Your Honor, if the court would look at um, the case of Record versus uh, Ellis, and I understand this is an old case, Your Honor, but I think it does help us, okay? Uh, it's uh, it's uh, 97, Kansas, uh, 754. It's a 1916 case. How it helps in this regard, Your Honor, is counsel seems to be hanging her hat on this fact of, of the uh, uh, father notoriously recognizing uh, the child as his child. And in that opinion, and I'm kind of working backwards here, if the court wants me to work forwards to the back, I will, but uh, I think that this record versus Ellis case really explains what, uh, what the issue that she's bringing out, meaning counsel for Susan Davenport's bringing out, and at page 756 of that opinion, it specifically states what is meant by the requirement of the recognition must be general and notorious. That's the issue she just stated. And the Supreme Court back then mm -hmm. explained for us what that meant. And what it said, and it, and it did refer to a bunch of uh, uh, opinions from the state of Iowa, because back then I don't think the state of Kansas had really clearly addressed this issue, but they did in this case. And what they said was, uh, and if the court will allow me just briefly read some of the, uh, the decision, some of the decision. It says at page 757, the Supreme Court of Iowa, whose statute is identical with ours, uh, has ruled that general means extensive, 
though not universal. And notorious is synonymous with open. It goes on to say, as defined by Webster, general means common to many or the greatest number, widely spread, prevalent, extensive, though not universal. And notorious means generally known and talked of by the public, universally believed to be true, manifest to the world. It goes on and uh, talks about yet another Iowa case. There are several Iowa cases that they that had interpreted this statute that was similar. And uh, it says that uh, there's a Watson versus uh, Richardson Iowa case that it cites. And it says both of these words are used in the statute with the design of emphasizing the thought that the understanding of the father's recognition should be as extensive as the immediate community of his residence and within the common knowledge of the public. It goes on. Extensive, common to many, or the majority but not universal, not concealed, open, generally and commonly known or spoken of. Those are additional Iowa cases that the Kansas court is, is citing. And if, if you look at that opinion, you'll see that I'm reading it word for word. Uh, uh, it and, and this, Your Honor, frankly, kind of goes to counsel's side, which is, the recognition required is not of heirship, but of sonship. This was the son in that case, and not the daughter. Um, it, it further, the, the, the court now in record, the Ellis R court is saying, the proof showed that the father frankly admitted the relationship when there was an occasion for him to speak and made no attempt to conceal the same, though it also appeared that there were many of his friends, relatives, and acquaintances who had no knowledge thereof. And if we look back at my request for admissions, Your Honor is going to see that that's exactly what we have here. Uh, uh, in that case, the father visited the mother after the child was born. I'm talking about Record versus Ellis now, uh, and actually sat on the bed and pulled the the child in his arms and testified you know or, or stated that this was his child um, now going on in the uh, Ellis opinion uh, it says <clears throat> um, let's see Mr. Mills if you back up a moment the case site on the where the Iowa cases were cited defining notoriously or notorious yes. yes what's the site for that the site your honor is yes. uh it is uh i'm sorry uh 97 kansas 754 uh it's a 1916 case uh but there are very few cases that define this. As a matter of fact, it's almost the only one I could find that specifically defined okay. these words. Ultimately, that may be helpful to the court, but I'm almost getting the impression, Mr. Mills, that you're making a closing argument following a trial in which Ms. Williams and her client have presented their evidence, and then you're trying to say it's insufficient to carry the day. Um, sure. I know that there's probably some incentive on behalf of your client to never let this go to court. But shouldn't she have the opportunity to to prove that Mr. Kennan notoriously recognized paternity of the child? Well, Your Honor, and I guess what I would submit to the court is, for the first time, uh, I saw these affidavits that were submitted. But if you look at the affidavits, Your Honor, even the affidavits she submits, which appears to be the evidence she's wanting the court to look at to determine this issue of notoriety, uh, even to try and get herself over the hump. They just don't make it as it relates to the legal definition that even if you believed everything to be true, it doesn't seem to me that you can, you can get over this hump because all of the uh, affidavits that she obtained were not 
as required under the record versus Ellis case. So, so I don't know what else she's going to be able to think she can bring to the table to establish this notoriety, but she didn't put it in any of these affidavits uh, that, again, I just recently was able to see uh, and obviously didn't have any time to respond to, but I'm trying to do my best to, to let the court know what the law is uh, so the court can take a look at it. Now, these affidavits, I, you know, um, Your Honor, uh, I know if the court wants us to waste a bunch of time having a trial and have me cross-examine these, these witnesses who, to, te to testify live, but I think if you don't get past the notoriety deal, you don't get past asking for a DNA uh, uh, sample. I mean, you've got to, you've got to be able to show at least some foundation, evidentiary foundation that 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 meets the the, the statute meets the case law, and it's not there. And again, I think the court was right in looking back at the paternity statute because they and it's it's only when you have that presumption that you can even look at the paternity statute, you know, and and. I mean, well, but they have a right to prove that one of the statutory presumptions exists. Do they not? Well, and your honor, if you look, what I'm trying to tell the court is if you look at the, the request for admissions, that even now some of them there, the court could look at and say, yeah, they're deemed admitted. But if you look at the affidavits, not that I'm saying that they should be considered evidence at this point, but if the court did consider them evidence at this point, they do not meet the burden of proof under the case law, you know, to find this to be a child of Mr. Kennan. And so, Your Honor, I think she's she's just not meeting her burden. And I don't and it appears to me that she can't meet her burden or she would have put much more into these affidavits. So Mr. Mills, are you representing to the court that there hasn't been a any discussion of what the word notoriously means by our appellate courts for just, 107 years. Well, Your Honor, there, you, you, I think there, you cited a 1916 definition. Your Honor, I understand. And and I, I'm I'm but, Mr. Mills. I'm much more worried about what the legislature meant when they placed in the KSA 232208, which apparently wasn't passed before 1985, what they meant by notoriously, which may or may not be the same definition that was used in 1916. Yeah, Your Honor, the one the one thing, and I, I'm kind of with you on, on, on what you're saying. There is a case, and I just found it uh, before, so I haven't been able to to you know review it very clearly so i'm going to make sure that's up front but i'm certainly willing to to share that with the court let me see if i can find where i wrote the site down um but there is a case called n ray parentage of mf that's uh 312 kansas 322 uh, uh a 2020 decision uh the and court is somewhat familiar with that, Mr. Mills. I'm sorry? The court is somewhat familiar with that case. Okay. So I, I wanted the court to be, you know, aware of that. And I think that does go somewhat to, uh, in fact, they talk about a timing element uh, of uh, the notorious representation uh, or a writing showing that he's, uh, that they, but as I understand it, that case is a little different in the facts because you had like a same sex uh, couple there. Now, whether that that in and of itself affects the language of the statute or not, I, I'm not real certain because I'm just telling the court I haven't had the ability to look through that because I just you know found it today. So well, I, I think that the trial this this court was the trial court judge on that case, as I recall. Oh, you may. And there was a companion that. case that was decided at the same time, where right. perhaps there was some more recent interpretation of the word "notorious." I, I don't recall that being a specific point in in the MF case, but 
I also note that the WL case that was issued the same at approximately the same time may have addressed it. So there may be some recent pronouncement from the court regarding what notorious means for purposes of the paternity statute. But be that as it may, um, I mean, there there is perhaps another alternative here. This court could cons consider just exhuming Mr. Cannon's body. I presume it's buried somewhere and it wasn't cremated. It's buried in Eureka, Judge, and he did have a traditional burial. So, yes, that would be. When did he pass away? 1976. 76? 96. 96. 96. Yeah. 27 96. years ago. Yes. And your honor, I will Has tell anybody you looked into the costs or the procedures that would be involved in exhuming the body for purposes of DNA testing. Uh, yes, your honor. Uh, and uh, let me back up just a minute also to tell you that we have submitted Miss Davenport's DNA and uh, we had submitted uh, one of her great uncles. Also, the great uncle uh, DNA has not been tested yet, but we do believe that will give us a result. But also the exhumation would be about $5,000. It's in Eureka. Um, I think that uh, there'll be have to be an order of the court, et cetera. But yes, I think we can get that done. And yes, we think that would be a, a good thing to do because we think that that's going to prove it. You know, I'm, I'm kind of perplexed by Mr. Mills's argument. Um, the things that he is saying about what general and notorious means we have affidavits of Mr. Kennan telling people this is his daughter. Uh, I don't know how much more you can have than he's telling several different people, this is my daughter, I'm her father. I know Him acknowledging that in writing me. would be a statutory yeah. presumption and, creating event. And at this point, we don't have it in writing. We have been looking, there were some letters um, we're investigating as much as we can. We lost a house fire. Yeah, there was a house fire, and we're afraid that they may have gone in the house fire. But we are looking for those. We have people who saw those letters, but unfortunately, we don't. Ha we haven't been able to find one of the remaining letters. So, we're investigating as much as we can. But your honor, you also have to understand that. I, I don't know how we reconcile the fact that an adopted child can adopt through her biological or her, her his or her biological family, even though they may be adopted by another family. So there has to be more than one path, not just paternity, but this other path of being held out generally and notoriously being their child. So I think through DNA evidence and or the testimony of quite a few different people about how he held himself out as her father and how it was known by everyone, and no one doubted it. it, this this was the fact that we can prove that she should be a beneficiary of this estate. Your Honor, I'd like to respond to that. You may, and, Mr. Mills. Thank you, Your Honor. The, the, the fact of the matter is, is, I can go through the case law that counsel cites right now, if the court wants me to, and show the, the vast difference in what happened in uh, the cases that she cites and uh, wherein the court in one of those cases found that uh, the, the the person was the child. In the other case, the court found that the person was not the child. But the facts are so different than what we're talking about. The other thing is that I think the court needs to be aware of all these uh, statements that she's talking about, four of them, do not even state that the deceased, Mr. Kennan, told them anything about the, the child as far as its birth or his paternity. The other ones are from Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Davenport's husband, her son, and her uh, cousin, I believe, and maybe a, a sister-in-law. And they all supposedly stem from one week in the life of the deceased, Mr. Kennan, wherein supposedly he meets over at her house, meaning Susan Davenport's, and is, and, and is purported to have made some statements. So one week out of 
28 years, I think, after the child was born, supposedly establishes an open, obvious, notorious, all this other stuff that I say it does not, even if you uh, adopt those statements as, as in some way accurate. But uh, uh, so, Your Honor, they don't even meet the burden. Your Honor, it's a situation, Your Honor, where where you have the the person who's here trying to, to get a essentially an award of money from an estate, and what is she saying? I my only proof is I say so, my husband says so, and my son says so, and my sister in law, and maybe uh, one other person, and that's that's it. This isn't doesn't meet the definition of notorious as set out in Ross. Hasn't uh, she been included in obituaries of the family as a daughter? Yes. Of, of Mr. Yes. Kennedy? Yes. And she's on his headstone too as his daughter judge. And it's a little more nuanced than what Mr. Mills is alleging. Well, yeah. Hmm. Your Honor, if, if, I, if, if you want me to respond to that, I can. It's, it's more nuanced than that. Basically, what he's referring to, several of his statements have to do with the fact that Mr. Kennan was re re when he had two weeks to live and he was released from prison, he spent those two weeks with his mother and with his daughter, Susan. And so some of these statements and these affidavits come from that time when... He, 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 he elected to spend the finite amount of time he had left on this earth with Susan Davenport, which you don't do unless that person is very close and very special to you. So yes, yeah, some of the, the, these statements are from then, but also statements are from prior to that, uh, the, when the sister-in-law, uh, the letters, the phone calls that she witnessed, um, and the phone and the affidavits that don't talk about specific statements made by John Kennan actually go to the, the notoriousness of his uh, recognition of his paternity. So I think it is more nuanced than, than Mr. Mills is letting on. I also included uh, uh, copies of the front and back of Mr. Kennan's uh, headstone, which she has listed as his daughter and his um, obituary, which lists him as list her as his daughter. So, Your Honor, I, I, I think Mr. Mills is, I think it's more nuanced than what he is he is talking about. Who provided the information for the obituary? Uh, his mother, uh, Mr. Kennan's mother, my client's grandmother. And well, we also I have, I, it, we, we've talked about that before. Uh, Clara Lodima Holderman, who was one of the original beneficiaries. Uh, and I think we had talked about that in an earlier hearing. Um, and also, I know that there are pictures, we didn't include them in, in this filing, but pictures that Clara Lodima Holderman gave to my client of the of the family and people like that, she, all the things that she was sharing with her granddaughter and the, uh, I think she put on uh, comments like, this is your cousin and things she like that. Letters saying who everybody was. Yeah. How we were related. Yeah. Who my dad was. Who... It's okay. It's okay. Yes. So, Your Honor, that goes to the notoriousness of Mr. Kennan accepting his paternity of Susan Davenport. So if we have an evidentiary hearing, we will bring in a whole line of people, including Stanley Cox, who used to be in the sheriff's department, who is her uncle, and tells you there is no doubt that she is John Kennan's daughter, even though the Cox family was the one who really was very upset that John Kennan was the father because Mr. Kennan was someone who was in and out of trouble with the law and was not of the same social status as their family. But they even admit, no, he was dad. And, uh, you know, he was a nine-year-old in the house listening to everyone uh, talking and everything that was said, and st including statements by Clara Lodima and his sister. So, Your Honor, there, there is a whole story here. There is a whole story here. There is it, it, there's a whole reason to understand that why she has every reason to be that she is John Kennan's daughter. I mean, it's, that's what it comes down to. Your Honor, the, I think it. You, we really need to, you know, okay. let the court know 
that when the mother of Ms. Davenport had the opportunity to be honest with the court, she was in the adoption case when she said father was unknown. Oh, and now okay. we're coming here and we're trying to say that she wasn't being honest with the court, you know, because she supposedly did know that John Kennan was the father. So which is the truth, Your Honor? I, I like to go with people who, you know, take an oath and, and say, hey, look, I, I don't know who the father is. Uh, and if she was saying, to, and I don't know that this is true or not, Your Honor, but if she did say that to somebody that this was uh, him, the, the guy who, who fathered her child, uh, there's no way we're going to be able to prove that he's, he's deceased and she's deceased. And, you know, so we're, we're asking for uh, people to, to override the representation that the mother made that she didn't know who the child, who the father was. Well, on the other hand, Mr. Mills, she also didn't say that someone else was the father. Well, your honor, when you say it's you don't just a, know, it's just an open book, a question that has never been answered. Uh, Ms. Williams and her client believe that they can uh, determine that there was a known father in the case. Yes. You're not having to rebut a representation of the mother. She just said, I'm not going to put a father's name down. I'm, I'm going to say it's it's unknown. Uh, the court has experienced that many women do put unknown on a birth certificate, even though they, in fact, do know who the father is. But they take that position because they don't want that particular individual named on the birth certificate. So um, I, I see your point that that's certainly not something that helps Ms. Davenport in her claim, but also it doesn't seem in the view of the court to hurt her much. Well, Your Honor. Because right. it doesn't I, establish who the father is. If I if I might say the, the Rickaball case uh, tells us that we cannot, we cannot base a, a, uh, an opinion uh, on speculation or conjecture. And that's all we will have is speculation or conjecture as to that issue. Yeah, yet to be determined, Mr. Mills. Uh, counsel, Mr. Weta, let me address you. Um, yeah, thank you. This court is currently contemplating sending these parties to mediation in this case to sit down with a mediator to see if there is some settlement that might be reached. Now, it would seem that the opposing parties that would need to be part of this mediation would be Mandolin Holderman and Susan Davenport. The, the other four aren't represented here. They haven't been actively involved in this case, even though the court has determined that they very well do have an interest. Nevertheless, they don't appear to be actively involved opposing Ms. Davenport. So rather than exhume bodies or have lengthy trials on this issue, isn't there some way, Mr. Weta, that we might be able to sit down? And of course, you would be a necessary component to the mediation because you represent the estate as a whole. And see if there isn't some way that this issue might be determined with the assistance of a mediator. Uh, I, frankly, Your Honor, I have no objection to um, attending a mediation um, with the parties. I will say, though, um, that frankly, it appears to me that um, Mandolin Holderman's position um, is she refuses to move off of that position. Um, uh, Mr. Mills has, frankly, in my opinion, filed um, multiple petitions out of time or out of order um, with the court to try and prevent Miss Williams' client from even putting on her case at a trial. And frankly, the answer to basically every single one of his questions and Miss Williams' client's questions is for us to have a trial or to exhume a body and have the DNA evidence and have the answer. Um, um, so I, I have no problem um, going to mediation. I've been to mediation multiple, many times. Frankly, we will be a kind of quiet third party in that mediation. Um, but, you know, I, I, I disagree with Mr. Mills's interpretation of several of the cases um, and frankly, the black letter law um, um, and, and we'll be willing to share that. But for the most part, we're here 
as the representatives for the estate to try and just determine where we're supposed to write the checks at the end of this. Um, and so, um, you know, the goal um, and our procedure, our, our goal here was to try and determine as much of this as possible through agreement before the initial petition to determine heirs was filed um, um, during the normal process of um, final settlement when the court determines heirs. Um, um, obviously, that was um, preempted by the um, by Mr. Mills and uh, Miss Miss Holderman's petition, um, and so we're now trying to determine that at this point. That's fine. We still need to know who the heirs are. Um, and my again, my position throughout this has been um, we have to give each individual the ability to present their evidence that they are an heir, because um, even even a child who is adopted out at birth has to obviously be given the opportunity to show um, that they are an heir because um, our probate code clearly states that they should be. And so the only way for us to determine in those situations or situations that have facts like these would be, for, as you say, to either have a trial on the facts and determine if um, there is a, uh, if, if the court believes after hearing the evidence that there is a, uh, um, an airship or um, we need to proceed to one of the other factors. And I believe that the blood test would apply here um, because again, the uh, the statute states that there are three different people who are who are there, as um, has been said multiple times. Children means biological children, including a posthumous child, children adopted as provided by law, and children whose parentage is or has been determined under the Kansas Parentage Act or prior law. Um, with the Kansas Parentage Act listed separately, that can't possibly be include the definition of biological children. As Mr. Mills has put forth, biological children must mean the um, actual biological definition of children. And in order for us to determine that, the, excuse me, that was my, don't forget the kids alarm. Um, the um, biological children must, um, the easiest way with the modern technology that we have is a DNA test at this point. And so, um, while I would love to avoid the expense of a trial or um, an exhumation, um, if Mr. Mills's client, uh, Ms. Holderman, is not willing to accept that Ms. Williams' client is indeed an heir, then I think that we have to put it to evidence, which means a trial. All right. Thank you, Mr. Weta. Statements are appreciated. Ms. Williams, is there any, any room here for a compromise, would, would a mediation by a trained professional be helpful to get Mandolin and your client together on perhaps resolution of financial issues or otherwise? I don't know, Your Honor, because Ms. Holderman has seemed so intransigent on this issue uh, that she, someone she once called a cousin, now she wants her to take nothing. And so I, I don't know if Ms. Holderman, you know, you have to go to mediation for mediation to be successful. There has to be a spirit of compromise. And I'm not sure that I'm getting that from Mr. Mills and his client at this point. I will tell you, we have, we have initiated DNA testing. My clients has been analyzed. We're still working on her great uncles. So eventually we will have actual DNA evidence uh, short of exhumation, but obviously exhumation still on the table, something that can be done. Uh, we will engage in mediation if the court feels that that's an option. I just, I, I'm just not sure that Mr. Mills's client is willing to go into that with the spirit of compromise that you have to have for mediation to even be possibly successful. That's my 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 concern. Nora, uh, you know, I'm tired of my client getting bashed all the time. The bottom line is she's asserting what I believe is the appropriate case case law and providing you the case law, which we tried to do as best as I can find it. Okay. And so as far as whether she's willing to uh, settle this case or not settle this case, if you recall, Your Honor, you talked about that at the last hearing. 
And I've heard no uh, communication from counsel or her client that they would be willing to engage in any type of settlement uh, negotiations. The other thing that I would point out, Your Honor, is it seems a little, I mean, and I'm, I'm a little worried about this, uh, and I truly am. We've got these four uh, people who supposedly have an interest in this estate. We've not heard a thing from them. We've con tried to contact them. Council has, I have, and I don't know if we even have the right address for these people, you know? And so it, it concerns me that I'm sitting over here trying to negotiate something with somebody else that might impact the amount of money that they may have. So I don't think it's really almost proper for us to leave them out of the loop. Uh, when I well, you make a good point, Mr. Answer. Mills, Mr. Weta, do you do you have a handle on how to contact these these four children of Esme Pearl? Um, yeah, but, um, we we have addresses that we believe are good. Um, none of the mail has been returned. Um, they've chosen not to participate. Um, but I would say, based on the court's orders at the last hearing, um, where the court stated that they would receive, I mean. We're talking about an airship. You don't you don't have to enter your appearance in an estate to receive your um, what is due to you under the statutory provisions. And um, I, I share Mr. Mills's concern to an extent. If if the settlement is anything other than um, an entire share for Miss William or the share that Miss Williams' client is entitled to, if she is indeed um, Mr. Kennan's daughter, um, or or you know. It, if we get outside of those lines, it could absolutely affect um, the share of those four children. Um, and so, but in order to do that, I mean, I think the court can appoint a guardian ad litem to represent their interests in the mediation. Um, but then we're just, again, adding additional um, expense to that mediation, which frankly um, is going to be the same thing that we would hear at trial. And so, um, again, I, I've got some consider concerns um, in along those lines. And frankly, Mr. Mills makes a good point that they are not represented in this matter. And so for us to compromise any claims, it would have to either not affect their share that they would be entitled to under the statutory provisions as the courts ordered previously, or, um, or we would have to have someone in there to represent their interests. And I frankly cannot do that. Even we, I have to try and treat every single beneficiary exactly the same um, uh, when representing my client, um, the personal administrator. So, court currently does not have a perception that mediation might be fruitful in this case. I think the parties are too entrenched. And I do share the concern that there would be a class of beneficiaries that wouldn't be adequately represented, even with a guardian ad litem, because obviously any possible settlement could impact the amount of their interest, unless Ms. Holderman were to bear, for example, the 100% out of her share of any uh, uh, thing that's paid to, to Susan, seeing that highly unlikely that that would be an agreement reached. It does not appear to the court that, that mediation is feasible, at least not at this time. Uh, turning next to what I think the ultimate solution might be, Ms. Williams, I will task you with this. I need you to uh, make an investigation of what it would cost, who would. I want to see something in writing from who would exhume this body, what the procedure would be for gathering of the DNA, because I don't know, obviously, I don't know who would do that. Mm -hmm. uh, probably someone from the DNA analysis lab would have to gather yes. a sample, and maybe I, even uh, from the cemetery scene, which yes, just sure. seems grisly to this court. Yeah, I, and I talked to one company who said that, 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 that they could do that with a court order, yes. Well, okay, and then I'm going to task you with the responsibility of drafting a proposed court order to send to Mr. Weta and Mr. Mills. Now, Mr. Cranmer, you still stay involved in this and you're certainly welcome at all times. Your clients have been determined essentially not to have an interest in this state anymore. So your position here, Mr. Cranmer? 
Thank you, Your Honor. I, I think that I've stayed quiet because of, of the ruling of the court. However, I will tell the court that my clients do want me to explore pursuing an appeal. Um, and that may throw a wrench in any mediation, which you've already determined is probably not feasible anyway. Um, and we still rely on the Strobel case. Uh, and I know the court's position on that. I'm not going to relitigate it. Um, but I think the court and everybody needs to be aware that I do think my clients are going to certainly entertain an appeal. All right. So, I, so how that, well, that include that's Mr. Cranmer in any communication then, Ms. Williams, okay. as well, obviously, as the court. And I don't know in what form you, you intend to send this, but I need to know who's going to exhume this body, what's going to be involved, how much it's going to cost, and then how the DNA sample is going to be gathered uh, chain of custody and how it would be tested. Okay. Obviously, mm -hmm. the, the most effective DNA test would be on the decedent. In other words, the right. suggested Mr. father himself, Mr. Cannon. Okay. He didn't leave a brother alive? I don't I don't know of any brothers that are alive that we have been able to find, Judge. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, we're not positive, but as far as we know, there are none living. Okay. that we know of but you want me to basically give you a document on who can do it how they'll do it procedure money etc yes okay. okay i just want to make sure i understand thank you judge yeah and your honor just for the record and um in order to potentially help miss williams um i have secondhand knowledge um, of an exhumation that took place in a proceeding similar to this um in sedgwick county so i can help put her in touch with the attorney who was the uh, special administrator's attorney in that case and um, help her get some of that information. Oh, that would be helpful, Mr. Weta. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Weta. Your Honor, I, I have another procedural question, if I could ask it, Your Honor. You may. Uh, since Mr. Cranmer brought up the fact that he was going to appeal, uh, yeah, and we're going to be having this journal entry signed, is he going to have to file a motion to uh, amend the journal entry so he can file an interlocutory appeal? Because we don't have a final order, and it seems to me if we're going through all this, these gyrations, <clears throat> and if Mr. Sandberg, uh, excuse me, if Mr. Uh, Cranmer is correct uh, on an appeal, then we're spending a bunch of time and a bunch of money that we ought not to be doing if he is correct. I don't, I disagree with his assessment. I agree with the court, but if he's going to assert that, then I think now would probably be the time to do that as opposed to, you know, uh, waiting till, till, and I don't know if you're considering this order that you entered to be a final order as it results to Mr. Cranmer, or if you don't consider it to be a final order as it admits to, uh, to Mr. Cranmer. And quite frankly, Your Honor, as to uh, your position that the four children should, the grandchildren should take, uh, you know, I respectfully disagree with that. And I may want to uh, appeal, I have to talk to my client, but I may want to appeal that uh, on an interlocutory basis. So I'm not I'm not sure where we're at from a procedural standpoint right now. It's a fair question, Mr. Mills. It's been the court's experience that the Kansas Court of Appeals generally disfavors piecemeal litigation and piecemeal appeals. It seems to the court, and I, I certainly can't make this ruling, at this time, but it seems to the court that the ultimate final order in the case is the one where this court ultimately makes a determination as to the disposition of this state. In other words, who's going to receive what share? That way, everyone's interest has been determined at that point, either favorably or unfavorably, and that appeals would naturally, if any are going to be filed, would stem from that final order. Now, if counsel sees it differently, you have to protect you and your client's own interests. But certainly that's how the court would see it. And certainly this court has specifically reserved and has not made a final determination as to the various shares of the possible claimants in this case. So well, I would be willing to stipulate to what the what the court has just said. I, I just don't want to have either uh, Mr. Cranmer or myself on the outside looking in and Somebody says, well, wait a minute, you should have filed an interlocutory appeal and you're too late. King's X, you're out. And so uh, if if everyone is, is you know, uh, 
agreeing that we can wait till your final order, then I guess I, if we'll all stipulate to that, then I guess I don't have any problem. I think it's well, the correct thing to do. I think it would be a fallacy to think that we could stipulate to appellate jurisdiction. Yeah. Either they have it or they don't. And they make that determination ultimately as to what their jurisdiction is. Yeah. But I'm just saying that that would be my view that until that that final order is entered distributing this estate in, in specific shares, in other words, all of these issues have to be determined. Certainly, Ms. Davenport's issue has to be fully determined. This court's in no position to make that final order regarding disposition of the estate. And it would seem that all appeals would stem from that final order. Okay. But you, your own research would determine whether that's uh, a proper position of the trial court or not. Yeah. But I understand the concern, Mr. Mill. All right, Ms. Williams, I think you I think you know what your task is. And if you yes, can maybe confer with Mr. Weta, it might help streamline things. Yes. Uh, how much time do you think it's going to take you to get that? I'm just yeah, why I, you be realistic with me. Three weeks, maybe. Okay. I, I think that's very optimistic, and I, I appreciate it. <laughs> it may be diligence. judge. <laughs> Well, I'm going to look have, for a review date. Counsel. Okay, I will endeavor to get it done. I, I, I don't want like this to fall off the court's calendar. I want to review this case relatively soon with this information available okay. so that the court can make an appropriate determination whether that will be in order of this court. Okay. A proposed order would be very helpful to... to proposed order. Uh, this has been done before, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. In other cases, I would be interested in what wording of the order is appropriate for this type of unusual proceeding. Okay. This is in the District Court of Butler County, Kansas, case entitled In the Matter of the Estate of Larry Holderman. It's case number 2022 PR 168. Uh, starting with the uh, estate's attorney, would counsel announce their appearances for the record, please? Um, good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, Trent Weta of Hinkle Law Firm appears on behalf of Judy Sullivan, the administrator, CTA. Okay, Williams, on behalf of claimant Susan Davenport, who also appears with me at my office via Zoom. Your Honor, Russell Mills appears on behalf of the beneficiary, Mandolin uh, Holderman, who also appears in my office. Very well. I'll also note that Mr. Cranmer, who has appeared at, at a number of hearings in this case, apparently was unavailable after the court had established this court date at our previous court proceeding back on October the 30th. I'll just note that he has a representative of his office here, ostensibly in the view of the court, to schedule a hearing on his motion for relief from judgment. Correct, Your Honor. All right. Uh, court will take that uh, under advisement and I'll make a ruling as to whether I'm going to set a hearing on that as part of today's proceedings. But before I do that, I want to address several other matters which are before the court. Uh, I note that uh, pursuant to this court's directions, and I think I'm going to go ahead and just read the pertinent parts of my docket notes from the last hearing, since I don't believe that there was a journal entry that anyone prepared to document that. Is that correct, counsel? That's correct. My understanding, Joy was to prepare that. Uh, I didn't. Well, my notes say this: the court grants no relief to Mills to preclude Susan from pursuing her claim as an heir. Mediation considered, but given parties' unwillingness to consider compromise, the court declined to order mediation. Uh, Ms. Williams was to provide the court and counsel a summary of procedure and cost of exhuming body of Susan's alleged father. Larry Cannon for purposes of DNA testing, noting that it was in a his body was in a Eureka Cemetery review hearing set for today. So I, it doesn't appear that the court assigned a responsibility to prepare a journal entry to to any party. And I'll just note that other than the court declining to uh, consider mediation, I don't know if there was anything substantive really to journalize there. Um. I do note that in pursuant to the court's direction, Ms. Williams has, and I'll give her credit for this, done exactly what I asked her to do. She has presented to this court a report to the court regarding procedure for exhumation of the body. 
and a cost estimate to all the different sources uh, necessary to accomplish this. I did have one question for you though, Ms. Williams. Yes, Judge. The cost to the city of Eureka. Yes. I'm not sure exactly what their role is. If, if private companies are gonna be doing essentially the excavation and opening of the vault and all of such things, what is the city of Eureka's $1,100 fee for? Your Honor, I agree with you. I kind of questioned that myself, but when uh, talking with the funeral director at the Zimmerman Funeral Home, he uh, made me aware that there are fees that the city of Eureka will charge. $550 to uh, disinter and $550 to reinter. And I think it's pursuant to an ordinance. In fact, I went in and looked and there are the city of Eureka has ordinances pertaining to the Greenwood Cemetery, and they have fees involved and regulations involving um, the interment and disinterment of a grave. So I got that amount from the funeral director who said that we will have to uh, pay that amount to the city of Eureka. For essentially disturbing their cemetery ground. Basically, yes, Judge. Um, and I'd be glad to call the city of Eureka and explore that more, but that was my understanding after talking to the funeral director. Yes. I, I was just interested in the origin of those costs in light of your explanation as to who'd be doing the other work connected with this. Yeah, I agree with you, Judge. I, I kind of raised my eyebrows at that also, but I wanted to include it because I understood that to be a potential cost. Certainly, certainly, and I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Mills, in response to the report, has filed petitioner Mandolin Holderman's objection to order for excavation of body and comparative DNA testing. I trust all of the attorneys in the case are aware of Mr. Mills' uh, objection. Ms. Williams? Yes, Your Honor. I just got it this afternoon, so I've only had a, about an hour and a half to review it. But yes, Judge, I, I have seen it. All right. Your Honor, Your Honor, I would like to say that I just received the paperwork that counsel provided to you, her report uh, and her proposed order. I've received that this morning. I had to scramble to get this together, this report, I mean, this uh, objection, which I believe is founded in the law and in the facts. Uh, and I believe the court should not allow uh, an ex, ex uh, elimination of the body uh, and this testing of the body. And I would note from my review of this uh, uh, report that she has done, uh, uh, it doesn't set out any statutory authority. It doesn't set out any case law that it advises the court of how it can issue the orders and for what it can issue these orders for. And I believe that we have to start there uh, to understand just exactly what you can do and how, how you're authorized to enter an order like this. And so uh, until we've had time to, to review that and determine that you do have the ability to issue those orders, those orders should not be authorized. And if you go through, and I will tell you, Your Honor, I didn't feel like I had sufficient time to, to respond uh, to this report, but I did the best that I could, uh, I will tell you, for the short amount of time that I had. And so, but Your Honor, what I would what I would say is if you went through uh, my uh, my objection, I think it pretty well sets out that what we really need to do, Judge, is we have to determine whether she has uh, standing in this case at this point in time, whether she can really pursue uh, this case, uh, and. When you look at my motion for reconsideration, if we look at that today, uh, uh, you'll see, I think, extremely clear 
instructions by the statutes and by the case law, some of it, Your Honor, that you frankly were involved in, uh, the MF case, that will show the court that she's too late. Her claim is barred, and to order a uh, uh, DNA testing and digging the, uh, the body up, this exhumation, is not authorized by law and is set out clearly in, in my motion for reconsideration and in my objection. Well, Mr. Mills, explain here. I cannot hear. Summarize, if you will, why you believe that she doesn't have standing. Okay. She doesn't have standing because the, essentially the statute of limitations has run, Your Honor. If you, if you look at... Uh, and I, I know I'm jumping around here a little bit, Your Honor, but uh, the uh, <clears throat> in Ray Estate of Foley case that I reference in uh, my petition for reconsideration, all right, it talks about genetic testing. And it talks about how we came to have genetic testing in the statute as a presumption of paternity. And it goes through the statute and tells us that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we got to consider the statute as written. We got to consider all the, not only the statute regarding genetic testing or authorizing it, if there was a um, uh, DNA test done before the death, uh, but we have to, look and see if that did not occur, which it didn't, uh, what does the statute say? And the current statute is 232209, which says, if you don't have that presumption of paternity, okay, whether it's DNA testing being done before the death or whether it's open notorious uh, recognition of the, of the parentage by the, by the parent, the alleged parent here, then we have essentially a three-year statute of limitations from reaching the age of majority. She is obviously more than three years past the age of majority, meaning Ms. Davenport. So the statute of limitations has ran to pursue- when, when did her cause of action accrue? I'm Just sorry? When did her cause of action accrue? Her cause of action could, well, it accrued, uh, really on date of birth, if she had somebody to come in and, and assort, assert the claim. Well, uh, that, that argument, Mr. Mills, that argument ignores the fact that she essentially was adopted out. She had no right to seek child support from Larry Cannon. We're not asking. Her, her cause of action, would it not have accrued when Larry Cannon, well, excuse me, when the decedent in this case passed away? At that point, her rights as an heir accrued for the first time. While he was alive and while this decedent was alive, she wouldn't have had any claim, would she? But her claims dependent, Your Honor, dependent upon her ability to prove that she that she is the daughter, that the paternity uh, would be established. And you have to look at the, the, uh, the Foley case. The Foley case was well, an estate. Your, what page did you cite that, counsel? Of, of your... your Honor, that's in uh, that's in my motion for reconsideration. Well, I was just and asking what page is it on. And if if you if you look at that, the last portion of that uh, of that uh, sentence uh, of that uh, opinion uh, basically said that genetic test results must be known before a presumption of paternity arises. If no genetic test results to establish paternity have been accomplished before the Parentage Act is commenced, and this is the prior statute, 3811158A2, which is now 232209, is applicable. And that's the statute that says you got the three-year statute from the date of, of, uh, of uh, uh, becoming an adult, okay, of minority. So uh, it's, I mean, it's black and white, Your Honor. But on top of that, on top of that, uh, you know, the NRA 
uh, MF case that you were involved in, Your Honor, talked about how the court recognized a timing uh, element was significant uh, at, to determine these presumptions of paternity, and specifically the one about being open and notorious, okay? And it said, under several, and I'm quoting word for word, your case, the, M, the MF case, under several of the presumptions, our legislature has made the timing of the child's birth significant. KSA 219 sub 23-2208-A1, A2, and A3. The court determined that each of those deemed the timing at birth significant. Okay? And it, they went on and said, these provisions support the idea that it is the moment of birth when Kansas law deems the child to have either one or two parents. And so, Your Honor, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but I was not aware of that case until just the day of the hearing or the day before the hearing that we last had. And I advised the court of that. And that's when you had advised me, well, I was the judge you know, involved in that case at the district court level. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll, I better look into this. And so I did. And what I found, Your Honor, was the more recent case, which was in the matter of the estate of EA. And what that case said, that dealt with a grandparent who was trying to have himself declared to be uh, uh, openly and notoriously say he was the father of this child, which was a legal fiction. It, it just wasn't the truth, but he wanted to make that claim. And what the court in the EA opinion said was, and this is a 2022 opinion, I got the opinion number, Your Honor, and it's in my, in my motion. Uh, but it said anyone, anyone trying to establish a presumption of attorney by openly and notoriously claiming the parentage must do so at the time of the child's birth. Can't happen. That's it. End of story. Um, and so what I would say, Your Honor, is where is the case law? Where is the statute authority? that overrides the court in either the MF case or the Foley case or uh, parentage of EA or 23-2208 or 53-2209. I can't find it. It's not there. And I would love for one of the other counsel to explain to me how these, these statutes and this case law that we're supposed to be following should be disregarded. I just don't believe that it can be, Your Honor. And I think if that's the case, we don't have to go to whether this body's exhumed or not, because we are doing a useless act because she's out of time and therefore has no standing to pursue this claim. It's over. So, uh, Your Honor, I could probably go on, but. Uh, that's the that's the kind of the gist of, of, of where I'm where I'm headed with this. The other thing too, Your Honor, is you know, I was concerned because uh, I think you were concerned about the the record v. Ellis opinion that talked about open and notorious uh, and general uh, recognition by the father. And it was an old case, 1917 case, and you thought, as a matter of fact, you brought up the question, well, was that you know, kind of still the law, or is that surely there's some other case? And that's when I said, well, the MF case, and I told you about that. And so that kind of led us into that. So I decided to go look at uh, the record opinion, and I shepherdized the, the record opinion all the way through to not today, but maybe two weeks ago. And uh, I also shepherdized the statute. 59501. And as crazy as this may sound, Your Honor, the record opinion is still to this day the opinion that gives a clear definition of general and notorious. 
And I set that language out in my uh, motion for reconsideration. She can't meet that burden even under the old case law, Your Honor. And so until she can meet that presumption, you've got to have that presumption first. You can't go to do anything else, and you're too late to do the request for the DNA testing under the statute. And so if there's some other case law out there, Your Honor, that I haven't found, then I apologize to the court. But I'm trying to do my best to get this information to you, to get the case law, to get the statutes to you, which I believe are just absolutely clear. And I've not heard anyone be able to argue and say, oh, no, this statute doesn't mean this or that statute doesn't mean that. And they don't have any case law to back it up because it doesn't exist. That's just as I see it, Your Honor. And if, if I'm wrong, then somebody needs to present their argument to you to explain why we can disregard the law. Because I think that's what this almost boils down to. Well, Mr. Mills, I would just make the observation, being somewhat familiar with that MF case, that was a case involving the rights to a, a child born during the existence of a same-sex relationship. Yes, I understand. I don't think that that opinion was written with this set of facts in mind, which are substantially different. I think we'd all agree. Well, uh, so I, I, I question whether MF would be a basis for binding precedent that this court should apply in this particular case. Furthermore, if you're taking the position that the relationship had to be established at the time Susan was born, she's the baby here, how was the baby supposed to assert her rights back then? Anyone, the statute allowed anyone on behalf of the child to assert that claim on her behalf up to the age of 18. And then after she turned 18, the statute allowed three additional years for her to assert the claim. One of the problems, Your Honor, I think that the court was recognizing was the very thing that we're facing. We're facing a situation where this lady was born all these years ago. We have, uh, and, and you, Your Honor, uh, allowed uh, the claimant to get her adoption records. We still don't have the adoption records, Judge. I think they need to be ordered into court so the court can review them. But what we've been told in those adoption records is that the putative father, Mr. Uh, Kennan, did not his name's not on the birth certificate. It wasn't, he didn't sign any acknowledgement of paternity. And on top of that, he didn't, wasn't asked to sign off on a consent to an adoption. And why was that? Because the birth mother in the adoption case said she didn't know who the father was. So we don't have either one of these parents openly and notoriously or in any way acknowledging at the time of the birth or really uh, even later that is on the record in any way uh, that this that he was the the birth father so so the adoption records themselves I thought your honor would clean this up but evidently they are wanting to pursue it so we had another hearing your honor and at that hearing we were told well, we've got some uh, DNA samples from a great uncle or something like that. And we're gonna go get uh, this tested. And what's happened to that? We've got no information about that either. But yet now we're going to go through $12,000 of expenses and she's asking the estate to pay for something that she has the burden of proof on. I don't think that the court ought to entertain causing the estate to have to pay to meet a burden of proof that I don't even think she has the right to even uh, try and attempt to meet. Um, so, Your Honor, uh, I, I I hope that you can uh, take the the time to review uh, my motion and even and my objection. Uh, I, I tried to as briefly as I could, you know, go through it. 
Now, I will tell you, Your Honor, and I, I want to make sure that the court understands this, and this is no, uh, you know, I greatly respect you, and I and I, I appreciate all your service, but I, I do believe that if the court is not inclined to, to follow my argument, then I believe that this is an issue of importance to the people of the state of Kansas. Uh, that does need to be determined. And it's obviously extremely important to, to the litigants here that we know exactly what the law is and that we don't go spending $12,000 or whatever before we do know what the law is. And so I would, if the court is inclined to rule against me, I would ask the court to allow the language of any journal entry to contain the necessary language under 60.2102 to assert an interlocutory appeal to get these issues, you know, resolved before any order might be uh, uh, executed on as far as digging up this body. I will tell you that. All right, just just a moment, just a moment before you go go forward. What appeal? What issue would be appealed? Well, the the issue of. Uh, whether or not she has the ability at this point in time uh, to to even assert this claim, like I just got through saying, or has does she have to meet the the presumption before she can come and ask you to 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 even do this testing? I think that's the very first thing you have to do. And if if she doesn't meet that burden, then she she almost doesn't even have to go to the the DNA testing if she does, but I, I don't think she can. And so the, the point of, of the matter is, is we have, we have a statute that says what it says. And it says, no, you got three years. You're saying, I mean, potentially you could be saying, no, that, that doesn't apply. I say that it does. I think that has to be clarified given this set of facts. And I think what's even more interesting in this case, Judge, is that you're in a position where you have to interpret, I think for the first time, uh, 59615 as it applies to a, a, a set of facts like this. Um, and, and there is no case law out there. It, it just, I mean, it doesn't exist that I can find. And I don't think uh, any, any other counsel can really find any um, any issue, I mean, any uh, prior case law to that effect, that this, this interpretation. The other thing, Your Honor, and I, <laughs> I know I've got, <laughs> I'm maybe rambling here, but uh, I have another motion for reconsideration uh, that affects the, the grandchildren and your determination that you could find, uh, you know, the disinherited children to be predeceased. Uh, I couldn't find any case law to support that either, or any statutory authority. And I have that set out in my in that my motion or my petition for reconsideration on that. I think that's also uh, an inter, a, a question that needs to be determined uh, by by the higher court, uh, if if need be. Uh, so obviously it all starts and begins and ends with, with your decision. And then if, if you believe that, that I'm wrong, which obviously you have that power, uh, then, then so be it. Uh, I just have to appeal those issues. And the question is, are they going to be on an interlocutory basis or are you going to determine these to be final uh, uh, orders and I, and I, the one comment that I would like to make too, is I know Doug Cramer, I respect Doug Cramer. I, I, I believe that he ought to have the right to present his voice and have it be heard on all of these issues. I don't know if the court has, enter, has entered orders that says he has no standing. Uh, I think he does. And, and I know he has filed a petition for reconsideration as well. I think all counsel should be allowed to participate in that uh, as well. Uh, so in fairness to Mr. Cranmer, it seems to me that, uh, you know, we should not enter any order 
uh, at least until he has the ability to, to participate. Because whatever rulings you may make on uh, Ms. Davenport's position uh, could ultimately directly uh, affect uh, it, whether it's the, the grandchildren or whether it's Mr. Uh, Cranmer's client. Hey, Russell, himself. Russell, I, I, don't, I don't think the judge is in the uh, room anymore. Uh, Mandy, oh. can you look at that? It looks like, yeah. Oh, I think you're right, Trent. I'm just rambling on. <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yeah, you're pretty quiet, but we can hear you now. Yeah, my speaker's messed up. I apologize. I Is Doug sorry. here now? Yeah, I just I just got here from my other hearing. So. Oh, okay. All right. I just, I just sat down like a minute ago. Oh, so all I right. Anything. Well, I was arguing on your behalf, Doug, so that you could be here. Well, I heard I heard <laughs> my name. My ears were burning. <laughs> But I, I don't know what's happened up to this point. I have my legal assistant in here with my calendar in case things need to get scheduled, but I can take over now, I think. Okay. Well, we lost the judge, so we we don't know what's going on. Yeah, I see Give that. Give him a few minutes. Give him a minute to get on here, and we, we'll get him back on here. Is this mine? Yeah. Hey, Doug. Um, just just to give you a quick rundown on kind of where we've been in the last half an hour, um, Judge um, determined that we didn't have a journal entry from the last uh, hearing. Um, um, he did find that Joy submitted what he exactly what he had requested um, um, with regard to the kind of procedure and cost estimate of what that um, exhumation might look like. Um, he did have a question for her about some costs to the city of Eureka that we that got straightened out, and apparently they've got a um, a kind of a, an exhumation and re reinterment fee um, that comes along with that because they own the um, piece, and then. Um, and then basically, uh, Mr. Cr or, uh, Mr. Mills has been arguing uh, since then regarding um, his motion on uh, uh, that he's presented in front of the court uh, from there. Okay. Okay, I see I have Mr. Cranmer on the meeting now. Yeah, sorry I'm late, Your Honor. I had I got my other hearing got finalized, so I um, signed on if that's okay. Well, your assistant was, was very patient, which I... I appreciate. I regret the internet service interruption, which disrupted proceedings here just a few minutes ago. Mr. Mills was apparently in the middle of his presentation at the time. Mr. Mills? Yeah, uh, Your Honor, so I I was uh, I had gone through my motion for reconsideration and but uh, so I don't want to, you know, uh, go over that again. Other than I, I would uh, tell uh, Mr. Cranmer that I, I did uh, present uh, arguments uh, that I believe uh, are set out within the motion, and I believe are are controlling uh, in this case, uh, and that I did uh, uh, object to the exhumation because there is no. Uh, case law or statutory authority for that. In fact, Your Honor, uh, as to that, uh, in the very short period of time that I've had to to try and address this, I did look up what the Kansas statutes say about exhum uh, exhumation of bodies, and uh, and. Uh, your Honor, that statute is KSA 19724, and it's the only statute I could find quickly regarding exhumation of bodies. And it says uh, that statute allows the court to have power to exhume a body for the purpose of ascertaining the cause of death. Obviously, that's not the issue that we have here. So, well, I would ask. Mr. Bill, the existence of that statute, which enables a county attorney or a district attorney to apply to a court to exhume a body, deals with their ability to perhaps test a body, uh, do 
of an autopsy for purposes of criminal prosecution or investigation. Uh, since it would appear that the legislature has given specific authority for that, it doesn't necessarily preclude exhumation of bodies for other purposes, does it? Well, Your Honor, I think we can't be reading into some statute that no one's even referenced that there is a right to do that. Uh, we're not a legislature. We we can't, you know, say, well, I, I think that the legislature would want us to be able to do this and have general authority by the district court to enter an order that is, I mean, this is very impactful to my client, Your Honor. You're talking about digging up her relative and dismembering him for some speculative reason from some lady who claims that she might be uh, a, a relative and maybe might be uh, entitled to make some claim here. That's a pretty drastic thing, at least in my client's view. She does not want that to happen. And there should be some statutory or case law authority to support such a severe thing being done to my client's relative. We don't know. Which, right, well, uh, okay, let me, let me stop you there. Mr. Let, let me stop you. Uh, wouldn't you think that the decision whether to exhume a body most, most logically, if we're talking about family or relative considerations, be made by the next of kin? Uh, Your Honor, I'm sorry. I, I, I could not hear what you said. I'm just saying that if there has to be a decision made about whether a body should be exhumed or not, don't you think that the relative in the best position to make that request would be the next of kin? Yeah, and she's not one. My client is. Objection, Your Honor. This no, is... no, wait a minute. I understand, Mr. Weta. I, let me finish my discussion here with Mr. Mills. Uh, Mr. Mills? Yes. Okay. What, I, what I'm is saying, indeed, Your Honor, is what we is have... Larry's daughter. If Susan is indeed Larry's daughter, she would be next of kin, wouldn't she? Susan is not Larry's daughter. Susan is alleging that she is uh, John oh, Kinnon's me. daughter. I, I, I apologize. I used the wrong first name. Not Larry, but Johnny. Okay. She Johnny is Kinnon. alleging. She's alleging she's the next of kin. She has no evidence to support that at this point in time. In fact, we evidence we have evidence that is contradictory as submitted to the district court in Sumner County, Kansas. So all we have is some proffers that I think were not timely submitted and should not be reviewed by the court uh, that are self-serving, uh, that are not supported by any other evidence out there other than uh, the claimant and her immediate family making some allegations that, again, I think are outside of the, the new timeline required under EA. And even if it's not under the new timeline required by EA, it doesn't even meet the requirements of the record opinion. So she is not a, a person, I believe, who has standing as a relative your Honor, I could I could file the same affidavits and say, hey, wait a minute, he was my father, and I could have my wife and my son and 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 a, a daughter-in-law, uh, you know, write out a I mean a, a son-in-law write out a, a statement saying, well, I heard him say something. Well, you know what? We're never going to get to hear anything from Mr. Kennett, and yet we're we're going to spend. She's now requesting us to spend $12,000 to meet a burden that she should have. This is not the estate's burden of proof. It ought not to be required to pay to try and establish some claim of someone who has to be at this point, Your Honor, I would say presumed to be not a relative. When we look at the the information that the court has already allowed her to get, the adoption records. And I want to know, Your Honor, too, what happened to this supposed claim of being able to get DNA evidence out of the, the uh, uncle? 
we've heard nothing. But yet now we're being asked to go ahead and authorize, have you authorized the payment of $12,000 from the estate? If I was representing the estate, I'd be pretty fired up about that. And I wouldn't want that money going out the window. But I mean, that's up to Mr. Weta. But but the bottom line, Your Honor, is if if we're strictly looking at who is the known family, that would be my client. That would be uh, the disinherited children of the testator. They would be, you know, people who might have standing. Um, once you get past that, maybe the well, I don't the grandkids, at least my position on that, Your Honor, is they don't have standing either. But, uh, but you know, if if their parents were in fact dead, then yes, they would. But, uh, but we're not talking about a relative coming to the court and saying, a known relative coming to the court and saying, Judge, we need to, we need to, uh, uh, you know, exhume this body, and we need to uh, essentially dismember it. You know, if if you think about that, Your Honor, if somebody wanted to dig up my him? father and dismem dismember him, what do you they mean? They have one heck of a fight on their hands. And this is okay. apparently this you're is not just not my supported. Question. Yeah, your question. I'm sorry. What do you mean by dismember? If you look at the report, Your Honor, uh, that she submitted, that the uh, claimant submitted, it says that the body is going to have to be potentially cut up. Uh, and it says uh, the decedent's body uh, to, to retrieve and take from the decedent's body such materials as deemed appropriate for DNA extraction, including but not limited to decedent's femur bones, knee bones, patella and or metatarsal bones. I think you got to cut the body up to get those bones to deliver them for testing. That is dismembering the body. That is revolting to my client that any court would consider doing that on a maybe I might be a relative, but I don't have any proof of it. But that's where we're at. That's what she's asking for. So all right, Mr. That's Williams, I'm, where she's at. Ms. Williams, I'm going to go ahead and give you the floor for a moment because I have a couple of questions for you. Certainly, Judge. Is your client seeking exhumation of this body for the purposes of DNA testing? Your Honor, if we, yes, we are because uh, we're working on DNA testing, but we do not have it yet. We uh, submitted the great uncle's DNA, but the lab said they didn't receive it. So we'd have to retake his DNA and start that process again. They have received my clients. Uh, we know that she has matched up with some other kin and relatives. Um, so we are working on that. And yes, we have some DNA evidence, yes. Uh, but given the litigiousness of this, we are very open to exhumation. This is, this is, I, I have to say on behalf of my client, a bit um, offensive. My client is more than maybe I might be a relative. It is members of Mandolin Holderman's family, to borrow Mr. Mills's um, wording, that have claimed Susan to be a member of their family and the daughter of Johnny Kennan. I'll just remind you that uh, she was included as the daughter in the obituary by the grandmother. She was included on the headstone as the daughter by the grandmother, Ladima. Uh, this is more than just a maybe, uh, maybe I'm, I'm the daughter. Uh, Mr. Kennan held my client out notoriously as his daughter. I, I know they're trying to shape the argument and the hurdles uh, to benefit them, Judge, but to notoriously and generally hold uh, someone out as being your child, I don't think you have to take out a full page newspaper ad. You don't have to start every conversation you have with someone with, hey, guess who my child is? Where it's appropriate, you identify yourself as the child's father or you identify that person as your child, and that is what happened here. 
It is not Mr. Kennan's fault or my client's fault that due to the politics between the family, the time that um, she was being born, 1967, that Mr. Kennan was cut out of the process of determining who was going to raise Ms. Davenport. My client was able to reconnect with Mr. Kennan as an adult. And for several years there until his death, they had a relationship. She told me, one of the first things she told me was, I called him up and I said, do you know who this is? And he says, yes, you're my daughter. Mr. Mills is trying to make it sound like you have to have everyone in the world knowing that he claimed her as his daughter. That's not what general and notorious means. To all the people who came into his past, where the question about his relationship to Susan came up, he claimed her as his daughter. And most significantly, he never said she wasn't his daughter. To the point that, once again, as Mr. Mills said, not my client's relatives, but Mandolin's relatives accepted her as their granddaughter, their cousin, and included her in Mr. Kennan's life in that way. The last two weeks of this man's life, knowing that he was dying, he spent half of that time with my client. You don't spend that with someone who maybe might be your child. Your Honor, just to use some, uh, just to go over some of the arguments. We know- well, we just, just a moment, before, before you do that, because sir. Uh, Mr. Mills has raised a procedural defense in your case. Correct. I think one of his suggestions is, is that you never properly petitioned for exhumation of this body. Yeah. He seems to suggest that there might be some procedural requirement that there be a formal petition for this relief, which you've never you've never filed. Correct, Your Honor. And basically, at the last hearing, Your Honor right. said that um, you were. Uh, and then you say, "Well, you're open to it." That's not the same thing as petitioning. I apologize, sir. I'm sorry. There was a no, go ahead. disconnect. I may have uh, thought you had stopped when you hadn't, sir. Uh, at the last hearing, Your Honor said that you were looking uh, seriously at the aspect of uh, ordering exhumation and asked me to put together that report with an order, a proposed order, and I did that. If we need a petition, I can have it on file by Monday. That will not be an issue. I do think the court can sua sponte order that. Uh, I think Mr. Mills is incorrect that just because that there is a statute allowing a district attorney or county attorney to pursue exhumation when they're looking at possible criminal charges doesn't mean that a court of equity can't order exhumation. In fact, I can tell you in the very brief time I had to research this, I found that the city of Eureka had a procedure of fees basically for exhumation and reinterment. I saw that the city of El Dorado had that. Um, there, I believe it was El Dorado that even went so far as to say that they needed an order from a district court. I saw the city of Hayesville, or excuse me, city of Hayes also had ordinances regarding this. So I don't think that this is prohibited, and I don't think Mr. Mills can show that it's prohibited. I think a court of equity can, where it finds that it is uh, necessary and it's the best uh, source of proof that they can go forward and order an exhumation. And I think you, I put that into my order that it was the best source of information, a determinative information for the court. Uh, did I answer your All question? Right. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, you did. Okay. Uh, the second uh, question I would ask you, I think Mr. Mills makes a good point regarding this being initially charged to the estate. Uh, the court can certainly apportion costs and expenses and attorney fees, ultimately in this case, which this court is ultimately going to have to do regardless of the outcome. But what about the initial cost being borne by the estate? Because should your client prove to be an heir, I don't think that that's a big deal. If it's shown that she is not an heir in this case, then the estate is incurred a substantial expense, how does your client intend to guarantee that or pay that back should she be wrong about her assertion of parentage? Can yeah. she put up put up the money, even if it's held by the court initially? 
I has have a security to, for, have to for the expense? I'd have to discuss with her putting up a surety, but if it's what's required, we will make it happen, Judge. I, I'm talking about her posting the money. Posting the money. The I would have to talk to her in more detail about posting, um, I assume, about $8,000. I do think it's an expense of the estate uh, to determine the heirs. I believe that we have shown you, um, we have tried to circumvent this by showing you proffers that... Mr. Kennan held her out notoriously as her as his child. Um, I think that that should be very good proof that this isn't a maybe wannabe situation. This is a, a situation where there really is no question of the people that, that are involved, that she is the child of Mr. Kennan. And I believe we meet the test of, of, of generally and notoriously holding her out as his child. I disagree strongly with Mr. Mills that we don't have that evidence. I think we do. And if we had an evidentiary hearing, an in-person evidentiary hearing, we would bring in a lot of testimony to show the court that he held her out generally and notoriously as his child. Um, as so, I believe that she meets a presumption that means that she is not time barred in pursuing uh, an action and DNA evidence that she is indeed Mr. Kennan's father, uh, child. I also think that the court has a good point in that she had no notice that she needed to make a claim until she was notified that she might be a beneficiary of Mr. Holderman's estate. And so if so, then she's under the three-year time limit. So I think no matter how we look at this, Ms. Davenport should be given the opportunity to prove her claim either by having an in-person uh, evidentiary where we show that he notoriously held her out, uh, showing DNA evidence, or exhuming the body and putting an end to this. So you'll need to talk to your client as to whether she can post a bond of at least $8,650? I will do so, Judge, yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Weta, uh, as the uh, attorney for the estate, are you taking a position on this issue that was just raised uh, um, with Ms. Williams? Yeah, um, I, I frankly, I I agree with Ms. Williams um, in that I believe that um, we, uh, my client, um, who is present with me, by the way, Your Honor, um, is required to um, determine the heirs of this estate. Um, and if if DNA evidence is the only way to do that, then I think that we can ask for it. Um, um, I, to, to bring this back around, um, there's been a lot of argument about the um, Parentage Act um, portion. Um, as we discussed at the last hearing, 59501 gives three different ways that the court can determine who are children who can inherit. Um, biological children, adopted children, or those children who have been or are um, determined to be children such under the Kansas Parentage Act. Um, the matter of estate of Fetch, Fetch excuse me, Fechner, um, F-E-C-H-N-E-R, it's 432P3-93, um, deals with this issue directly um, and um, on page 95, going into page 96, the court specifically states, from the definition, we know that a biological child would qualify, but there are three ways to qualify as a child. One, biology. Two, adoption. And three, having parentage determined under the Kansas Parentage Act. Um, the, um, the court further goes on to say that the statute connects those three by and, showing that all three ways qualify under the probate code. Um, so far, all of the argument today has been regarding that third um, piece, but I don't think that the court can disregard the fact that biology is the first way that the court can determine this. And the way for us to determine biology is not by presumption, it is simply by um, a blood test. Um, the, the um, matter of estate of Fechner goes on to state um, that um, the district court does have the authority to order DNA testing um, in a probate matter. Um, it is, it's clear. It's, it, it, and this, 
Um, in that case, there was not a deceased individual who was being tested, but instead the, the order was um, against a person who was alive. Um, but it is an, the, the analysis in that case um, looks to um, the uh, discovery provisions in Chapter 60 um, via uh, Supreme Court Rule 144, um, which allows the probate code to look into Chapter 60 for, for that and only that reason. Um, um, with regard to the other Chapter 60 arguments that have been made, without them being tied back directly into the probate code, um, this case is also clear that, quote, no provision in the Kansas probate code specifically incorporates the Kansas rules of civil procedure, um, citing N. Ray Estate of Wolf, 32 Canap, 2nd, 1247. Um, I, I think that the court doesn't need to go into um, the parentage code, but can stay well within chapter 59 and still make these same orders, um, given the case law um, of the state of Kansas. Um, you know, Mr. Mills said that he um, shepherdized all of chapter 50 or 59501. If he did, he would come across this case. And this case is clearly on point for the issues that are in front of the court. And so I do think that there, um, that the court has the authority to do so. I think that the estate has the obligation to present the best evidence to the court, or if unable to present that evidence, um, ask the court for a petition to instruct for instructions. Frankly, if Ms. Williams was not here um, representing her, that would have been my recommendation to my client was to file um, a petition for instructions to the court to determine if we should be doing an exhumation or some uh, or something else with regard to the um, this specific aspect. Um, I do not want to have to spend this money, um, frankly, um, but again, um, the the idea that that we shouldn't allow for the discovery statutes um, that do apply in Chapter 59 to be carried out um, seems improper to me. And furthermore. The cost here, um, at, even at $12,000, is frankly far less than what the interlocutory appeal will cost the estate um, in the long run. And to that matter, um, we, we filed a petition for interim fees because our calendar year is closing here shortly. Um, and, all at, and frankly, mostly as an illustration to the parties in the court on the amount of fees that have been incurred by my office, um, trying to keep straight all of the different petitions um, all of the statutory citations that have been put here, there is there is some complicated, um, interesting implications of the um, of the um, probate code in the state of Kansas here, um, and and I do think that there are some questions uh, um, that haven't been asked previously, um, but I also think that the court can resolve all of those before we find ourselves in um, need of appellate uh, jurisdiction, um, although that frankly is not my forte, Your Honor. So um, I would um, I would say that um, I would leave it to the court to determine. Again, we would um, we would have petitioned for instructions from the court anyway um, to determine this issue because I think it's absolutely a necessary issue to determine before we can apply for final settlement of this estate um, without being able to offer the court the best information about who the heirs are and who is entitled to what share under this estate. Um, a, 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 petition for final settlement and distribution would be premature. And so, um, frankly, I think we need to learn this. And so, again, I leave it to the court's discretion as to whether they will order this or not. Um, I would say, though, that my position is um, on costs that, um, at least from this perspective, as long as the court is comfortable that um, Ms. Williams and her client have presented a, um, adequate evidence to move forward on an exhumation and and her claim, in effect, we there, there's a there's good cause shown. I believe is what this um, probate code refers to. Um, that if the court finds that good cause, then the court can order this, and it would rightfully be an expense of administration. As much as I would love to not spend a bunch of extra money determining who the heirs are. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wada. Mr. Cranmer, uh, you've joined the meeting late, but uh, I know that you have a motion before the court. Is there anything that you wish to address the court about today? Just briefly, Your Honor, and, you know, as you noted, I have a petition to alter or amend the, the ruling that you made earlier. 
Um, thereafter that we would maintain a right to appeal if my clients and I think my clients are going to want me to do that. Um, if it turns out that our position is correct and that uh, Strobel and Hainberg control this case and that my clients would take uh, via intestate succession, then none of this DNA testing would be necessary or required and it would be an expense that the estate would not have to bear. Uh, because my clients would take via intestate succession as the children of the decedent in this case. Uh, so at this point, our position would be the court should not authorize the, at least the estate paying for the exhumation or any genetic testing of Ms. Davenport or Mr. Kennan if he's exhumed and, or whatever, at least until uh, there's a final resolution on whether or not um, my clients uh, take uh, via intestacy uh, pursuant to Strobel and Hainberg. All right. To make sure I understand what your uh, re-argument is here, Mr. Kramer, it's my understanding that, uh, let, let's just review what the facts are briefly. In this case, the decedent in this case, Larry Holderman, uh, you still with me, Mr. Kramer? Yes, I'm here. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what all that noise is about. Okay. All right. Well, well that's great. Cool. 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 I don't know if you can hear me. You're muted. Yes, you're. You're on the meeting, Mr. Mills. Your Honor, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. All right. Well, I was I've been off for about fifteen or twenty minutes here. I think no. maybe ten. I don't know how long it is, but I have not been able to hear you. I was totally off. I don't know. Uh, the The last thing I heard was that Mr. Weta had started to speak, and then I we lost him, and then I we just got back on, and I heard. Uh, Mr. Cranmer start to, uh, to to say some things and then we lost again. We heard this beeping go. So I had to shut my phone off. So I was trying to get on the phone so I could at least hear what was going on. So I've, I've missed out on a big chunk of the argument is all I'm trying to tell the court. All right. Well, the court has issued no rulings based on anything that's been said, Mr. Mills. I will assure okay. you of that. Uh, Mr. Weta did set forth his position on several issues. And I regret that, that you did not hear them. Um, I was addressing Mr. Cranmer about his motion to alter or amend judgment. Uh, and I just wanted to clarify what his position was. Mr. Cranmer? Yes, sir. All right. Um, now, now, I think you take, again, I wanted to review the facts of what happened here in a very simple way. Decedent in this case, uh, left his estate under his will to his parents, specifically disinheriting by language in the will his two children and your clients, essentially. Uh, since his parents pre think you take the position in the intended gift lapsed, correct? Well, our position is the will failed because the, the gift was not completed because there was no residuary clause. So therefore, the will fails and my clients would take via intestate succession, a la the Strobel case and the Hainberg case. And well, I, think you're, I think you're just using craft, crafty language to try to get around what, what really happened here. I think you're arguing that, that the gift lapsed. Therefore, the anti-lapse statute would apply in a situation of a gift lapsing, wouldn't it? No, under the Strobel case, which is, is under, we say very similar facts to this case, the, um, the intended testator or the decedent or the legatee uh, beneficiary of the estate predeceased the decedent and there was no residuary clause in that will and the Strobel court held the will failed and that the disinherited person who was the for, the spouse of the decedent took via intestate succession. 
That's what we're saying happens here. The anti-lapse statute doesn't apply because the will failed. And that's what the Strobel case stands for and the Hamburg. And the Strobel case also says specifically that being disinherited in a will does not prevent somebody from inheriting via intestate succession. That's our position. All right. Uh, and I think that this is really a, a position that you've taken all along in this case. Would you agree, Mr. Cranmer? That's, that's correct. All right. And you're asking the court to reconsider the case law that you've cited and to reach a different result. Yes, Your Honor. And there's case law out there that says if I don't object and give the court the opportunity to correct what we believe was an erroneous ruling, then we lose our right to appeal. I see. All right. I mean, that's, that, so it kind of puts me in an odd position um, when we're talk, talking about too much about whether we should exhume a body or not, because frankly, if I'm right, then it doesn't matter to me other than we don't want the estate paying for the cost of that until my client's rights have been finally, finally determined on appeal. Um, and if I'm wrong, then I don't know that I'm my clients have any standing to advocate for a position one way or the other. It's kind of an odd situation. Um, I do um, believe there's case law which indicates that your order with regard to my uh, parties, my clients, is a final order that is appealable, which is contrary to what the would be in a family law case. But I do have that. And I don't, I didn't bring my file. I just came straight in from my other hearing. So I didn't bring my file, but I think there's a case that at least makes me cautious enough and concerned enough that I think I need to proceed as if it's a final order. All right. I understand counsel. Well, there are many issues that I talked about today. Uh, a lot of filings, and I think we would all recognize if we're relative to give them proper and full consideration. I'm going to take the issues which are currently before the court under advisement. I may be issuing uh, a written ruling. Uh, I think I'll have to start, obviously, with a ruling on Mr. Cranmer's motion because I think his point is well taken. Uh, if his clients are indeed found by this court to be the ultimate beneficiaries, I don't think there's any need to discuss any further uh, the issues regarding Susan, D Susan Davenport, paternity, exhumation of bodies, or many of the other issues that we've discussed here today. So uh, the court will uh, issue a ruling here in due course. Counsel, I don't want to lose uh, track of the case, though, and I do want to schedule. I was calling a status conference at this point something set on everyone's calendar to rediscuss this case in the not too distant future. And I think I'd be looking probably at a January setting. So I hope everyone's got their calendars. I at least brought my calendar in your honor. I did do that. I should say my legal assistant did that for me. I didn't do it. Let me throw out the uh, date of January the 19th at 10.30 in the morning. Your Honor, uh, because... 10.30 a.m. from... That's December. Just a minute. I'm looking at January. Yeah, I need January. Your Honor, would uh, be able to do it maybe around... I didn't hear your response, 11? whatever it was. That would be, uh, that way I could make sure I was done with court that morning in time for the hearing. Okay. I didn't hear that. So, Ms. Williams, you want to say that again? Uh, my apologies, Judge. I was just looking. I have a standing obligation on the 19th in the morning. I was wondering if we could go later, like 11 o'clock or 1130, just to make sure I would be done in time. To join this hearing. 11 o'clock is fine. 11. Thank you, Judge. 11 o'clock would be fine, Counsel. All right. Mr. Weta? I am available on the 19th of January at 11 o'clock. All right. Mr. Mills? Yes, Your Honor. I, 
I would I would be available uh, on that date at that time. Um, All right. And then last but certainly not least, Mr. Cranmer. Yes, I'd be available. Judge, is this a status conference or is this a hearing, uh, hearing that, on the motion? I, I will call it that. That's a status conference. Um, counsel will be advised if I'm going to expect argument or presentation on any issue uh, to make it a hearing as such. We'll review the status of the case at that time and the court will do appropriate scheduling or as may be appropriate at that time. It's also at least possible that the court might be making one or more rulings and announcing those on that day. Especially as winter is. So Friday, January 19, 11 o'clock a.m., a status conference by Zoom in this matter. Uh, Mr. Wett, is there anything else that the court needs to address further um, at this time? Simply, Your Honor, I, I, we did file a, uh, a motion asking the court to look at our um, interim fees. Um, but if the court's not keen to do that at this time, then we can um, push that off until later. Um, but we, we are a significant amount of, of, of money into this case and would like to, uh, um, well, frankly, it's the end of the year and I've got numbers that I have to try and do the best I can to meet. And we've done a lot of work on this case this year. So um, um, I, I'm Was glad- Was there to... any objection to his submission, counsel? None from my client. Is, is anyone objected? No, Your Honor, not from my client. Your Honor, I've not seen it. <laughs> I've not seen any okay. submission. All right, then I won't. I won't make a, a sua sponte ruling here. Then, okay. um, all right, I'll, I'll take a look at that, Mr. Weta. Thank you, Your Honor. And no, make a please. specific note about that. All right. And, and if Mr. you Mills, need any... anything further at this time, well, Your Honor, the only thing I want to make sure of is that, uh, you know, procedural. I, I, I I'm. Trying to be as, 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 I guess, kind or whatever as I can be, but procedural, I, I, I'm not sure that we have been tracking with the procedure. I, I'm, you know, I've not heard any response. I mean, I know Mr. You told me Mr. Wet I've made some response to something, but I was not able to hear it, so I don't know what he said. Uh, I've seen no written response by Mr. Weta to any of my motions. I haven't seen any response from Mr. Uh, 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 Cranmer to any of my motions. Uh, and the responses that I've received from uh, Ms. Williams were not, in my opinion, timely under the rules of civil procedure. So I don't think that any of the parties, to be quite honest, Your Honor, have, have had the adequate time to be able to address the other per portions, uh, person's uh, uh, arguments and respond. And so I, I think that the court might be cutting off really all counsel a little bit before, uh, you know, they can absolutely be able to respond, especially when we're having these cutting in and cutting out of the, of the record here. And that's not anybody's fault. I mean, as far as the cutting in and cutting out, I'm not, you know, accusing anybody of that, but all I'm wanting to make sure is that we all have an opportunity to, to respond or, or reply in some way to the other party's uh, position. Um, and, you know, I would welcome hearing the other party's uh, case law that they think might uh, affect this. And I know, Evidently, Mr. Weta must have tried to do that, and I just didn't get to hear it. But uh, so uh, I may want to respond to to what he had to say. I, but uh, I don't know what he said, so I don't know if I have to. <laughs> so All right. I'm just asking for the opportunity to be able to to respond if need be. All right, Mr. Weta. Um. Yeah, I was just going to ask. Yeah, go ahead. Here's what my suggestion was going to be. Can you give Mr. Mills a call after we conclude this meeting and give him 
essentially a summary of what you presented to the court regarding the Fechner case, uh, your biology section of the statute that you referred to, um, and any of, and I think Mr. Mills should be entitled to hear what you address the court about. Are you in a position to do so? Yeah, I can do well. Um, yes, I can do I can do my best. If we wrap up here quickly, I can before I have to go get my kids. Yes. Yeah, I, I will be glad to. All right, then, then I would just ask you to do that, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Ms. Williams, anything else we need to address today? No, Your Honor. And Mr. Cranmer. Nothing further for me, Your Honor, for today. Very well. Thank you for joining the meeting. I know that you were pressed for time today, Mr. Cranmer. Yeah, right. I was. If there's nothing further, at the... okay, go ahead, Doug. I just apologize for being late. I got here as soon as I could. But again, your assistant was right on the meeting when they were supposed to be and essentially took your place and probably heard some things she regrets hearing. But <laughs> nevertheless, uh, we're concluded for today. Uh, Mandy, you can end the meeting at this time. Yeah. Uh, various matters come before the court today. This was a, a status hearing that was established by the court earlier following some earlier proceedings in the case. Counsel, there are two motions which are essentially either motions to alter or amend judgment or motions for reconsideration that are before the court. There is no uh, statutory provision under the probate code for such motions. However, under the rules of civil procedure, uh, the court is not required to conduct any type of hearing on such motions and may rule on those uh, without any further hearing. And the court's prepared to do that in relation to two of those motions that have been filed in the case. And I'll announce my decision on those uh, motions at this time or petitions. Regarding the petition to alter or amend judgment filed by Frank Bly and Terry Robertson on November 28, 2023, this court has considered the re-arguments made by Mr. Cranmer in his pleading and finds no error or cause to alter or amend judgment and stands by its findings and orders set forth in the order of October 31, 2023. Regarding Mandolin Holderman's objection and reconsideration of order allowing interim fees and expenses incurred by the administrator CTA, the court rules that it, it did ask Mr. Weta's firm for itemization of services rendered and explanation of how the sought amounts were computed, including consideration of the amounts charged, which the court subsequently received and considered. While this court would consider the amounts sought and allowed to be in the high range for such legal services, those amounts were in the expert and experienced judgment of the court to be within the flexible and wide range of reasonableness. Not being deemed to be clearly excessive, the court approved the interim request for fees and expenses as, as it is in the court's prerogative to do so and reaffirms such ruling now. The request for reconsideration and an objection is denied and the ruling stands. Further, the objection document does not state sufficient grounds for fiduciary removal. The administrator CTA's prior acts do not disqualify her from administering this estate as long as her acts are approved by this court and she follows this court's directions in a competent manner. Judy K. Sullivan continues to be approved as administrator CTA of this estate. With those rulings now made, Council, we've obviously got one large issue still looming before this court, and that is uh, a ruling by this court on the request made uh, by Ms. Williams on behalf of her client for the body of Johnny Rex Kennan to be exhumed and comparative DNA testing to be done. Mr. Mills has filed a number of spirited responsive pleadings and or objections to her request to do so. I trust that you still make those objections at this time, Mr. Mills? Yes, Your Honor, and I have more. All right. 
If you have more, then I'm going to have you start this proceeding by providing your additional arguments to the court. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, uh, at the time that I had uh, prepared uh, the objections that, uh, that I submitted, uh, I did not have uh, some case law that uh, I think the court really needs to be uh, uh, aware of. Uh, I really, Your Honor, to, 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 to make a really good record, I, I really should go through uh, the entirety of some of my uh, uh, prior uh, arguments because they do directly impact this issue. Uh, but if the court is directing me not to do that, then I'll just direct the court to what I have uh, found uh, since uh, this last filing. Um, so whichever way the court wishes me to proceed, I'll do it. I will tell you if I go through the entirety of what I believe I should do to help the court, uh, it's going to take me a while. And uh, I may go over some ground that you think I've already covered within the motions. So I, you know, obviously I'll do whichever way you want me to go, Your Honor. Uh, I can give you the, the shorter version as to what I haven't talked about already, or I can just, uh, you know, go through what I believe really needs to be gone through. Because I, one of the things that I, that I do want the court to know, and I, and I don't know if, uh, if the court uh, got to review my my uh, my last uh, pleading, uh, I did. Mr. I, okay, and and within that pleading, Your Honor, I don't. Uh, I, I would imagine the court saw that that uh, Mr. Cranmer and I uh, had you know continued to try and uh, figure out a way to mediate this this case, and uh, you know thanks. Uh, a, a lot to the efforts of Mr. Cranmer. I think we've been able to get that done. However, the problem is, Your Honor, that that agreement's going to be contingent upon how you rule regarding uh, the claim of uh, Ms. Davenport. Uh, so, so this becomes a, a central uh, uh, decision uh, in this case. Um, How is that, it, Mr. Mills, that you and Mr. Cranmer alone could negotiate a settlement of this case? Well, what, what wouldn't I'm it saying, require eight signatories to have well, a family want, settlement agreement under the facts of this individual yes, case? Yes, Your Honor. What I'm what I'm trying to advise the court of is is that, as I understand it, and speaking to Mr. Cranmer, that uh, his clients, the, the two primary clients of his, have he disinherited it the disinherited children. heirs, yes. my client, and then the grandchildren are going to be willing to sign off on uh, this agreement that we've got worked out. So the only people, the only person uh, who's on the outside of that agreement is the alleged illegitimate daughter. So uh, with that being said, Your Honor, th this case is resolved depending upon your your ruling in that regard, uh, and I think you should also know that you know. And I, I runner, don't take this as a threat in any way because it is not meant that way. Yeah, you know, I uh, uh, I respect your opinions, uh, but the the concern that I think both Doug and I shared was that there was going to be a tremendous amount of additional expense through appeals if we couldn't get something worked out. And I think that's one of the things that really inspired uh, uh, the family members to say, well, we, we've got to get this worked out. Uh, but the problem still remains the issue of, of uh, Ms. Davenport. And so uh, in order to be able to really go through why I believe the key issue is, at this point, uh, does she or does she not have a claim? And I respectfully submit that she she does not. And uh, you know, uh, in in looking at at what is what has happened in the past, uh, 
we can do that, but I think we should kind of do so in, in kind of a uh, reverse chronological order. And that's why I'm telling you about this last motion that I, that I prepared and that you've, you've denied, which is, I mean, as it relates to, uh, you know, uh, removing the current executor, I think maybe I, I, I stated that too harshly because I don't mean to, to, you know, insult the current executor. I don't, uh, or, or administrator CTA or her counsel. Uh, Your Honor, as I, as I would like to point out, I did not in any way, shape or form uh, attack the, uh, uh, the amount that counsel himself presented. He, uh, he very clearly in a 20 page breakdown of his timesheets set out what he did. I didn't oppose that at all. What I was trying to tell the court was his client, the executor, didn't provide you any information. That's all I was objecting to. I wasn't objecting to counsel's fees. And, and so if, as I understood what you had requested, Your Honor, you wanted to know, you know, well, what justifies these fees? Not just counsel's fees, but fees for the uh, administrator. And... Um, you, you didn't, your Honor, you didn't, Your Honor, can I object to this? Um, the the court made the ruling previously and has already entered this into the record. Um, there's no need for us to relitigate this issue with four attorneys. All right, and so why are we going through this, Mr. Mills? Okay, well, let me let me explain. One of the one of the reasons, Your Honor, is is when we get this settlement done, if we if we're given the opportunity to do that depending upon your ruling. Uh, one of the things that we're concerned about, and I think uh, uh, Doug agrees with me, that we are spending a great deal of money that we do not need to spend if this decision is made. If this decision is made to, to deny the claim of Susan Davenport, then I have indicated and Doug has indicated that we will be more than willing to prepare the documents to conclude the estate. And we don't need a third attorney. We don't need another executor because my client would be willing to serve for free at that point. And so I think that benefits. You already have an administrator CTA. We don't need your, your client to volunteer. Well, to I you. understand your honor at this point, I, I agree that we do. What I'm saying is depending upon your ruling that you make, do we, we have two attorneys that are very capable of concluding the estate and we have my client who's willing to do so for free. So why do, should we, if all issues are resolved, but they're not, why do we need to keep, they're not as yet. Okay. I, I agree with you as to that one issue that is not resolved. That's why we're here today to kind of talk about. Uh, but the reason I'm trying to talk about, the removal of the uh, is if you make that determination, we can slide right into, all right, let's save the estate more money because we'll have a, an executor willing to step in and, and do it for free. So, I mean, it can't get cheaper than that. So anyway, uh, judge, if I can, if I can uh, move to uh, kind of the heart of, of this case, which is at this point, uh, Miss Davenport's, uh, claim and you know why it why it should be denied uh maybe the 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 first thing that we can go to is the objection uh as to the um uh, the uh, exhumation and your honor i have cited uh, uh uh case law and i did go through uh the case that uh um uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Weta had provided to the court the Fetchner case, and I, I, I hope the court's been able to review that. I did attach it as an addendum to my motion for reconsideration in the uh, on that petition to dismiss. But you know, I got to thinking about that, Your Honor. I'm not sure that you've ever ruled on my motion to dismiss, so maybe that was a premature motion for reconsideration. 
But at any rate, I do think that the court uh, should have the benefit of a review of, as I did for the court, of the Fetchner case and why the Fetchner case uh, really is supportive of, of our position. Uh, and Your Honor, I, uh, I had titled it Addendum to Petition for Reconsideration, so I don't know if the courts had an opportunity to review that uh, or not. Have you? I have. Mr. Okay. Mayor. All right. So <clears throat> one of the things then that I, I would also like to, to point out, uh, and this is just kind of periphery as far as I'm concerned, but uh, in the, in the, uh, petition uh, that council filed to exhume the body. Um, she cites no, no authority, uh, whether it's statutory or case law to, to support that. Okay. And she doesn't in her report uh, provide a complete report of what is needed uh, in a exhumation. And uh, what I point out to the court is, as I understand the exhumation, and I personally, Your Honor, spoke to uh, the uh, doctor who's involved in, in uh, the DNA solutions uh, examination of, of the of the bones and he indicated that they would not be returning the bones to Kansas that if that was needed then someone was going to have to you know pay them to bring them back and what I was understood from talking to him as well was that when you exhume a body you can't just leave it up on top of the ground after you've taken the legs away and taking them to Oklahoma, you've got to put them back into the ground. And so when you bring the bones back, if you do, then you're going to have to bring the body back up and put the bones back in. And so this does not report that this, this report that was, that was given. Um, also, I was told, I spoke to the, um, uh, the rest home, or excuse me, the funeral home, and they indicated that when they go to Oklahoma and deliver a body, and of course, they were talking about the entirety of a body, not parts of a body. Uh, so whether that's accurate as to parts of the body or not, but he was saying they would have to pay a $250 fee to transport uh, a body and uh, across the state lines from Kansas to Oklahoma. And then, so if you had to do that twice here, you'd have another five hundred dollars too um so there's just a lot of expenses your honor that that do not appear here uh that the court needs to be made aware of the other thing in that regard your honor is uh counsel and her petition was uh wanting to uh require the estate to pay uh for this and you know, they liken uh, the examination of the body to the physical, physical uh, the examination uh, under 6235, uh, which is a physical and mental uh, examination. But if you look at 6235 2C, Your Honor, it says that the court must direct the moving party to advance the expenses that will necessarily be incurred by the party or person to be examined. So, so that, that's just as clear as a bell. So if, if she, they're wanting to get that done and if the court is willing to uh, consider it, then they're gonna have to pay for it. Does, does honor, the estate though, Mr. Mills, doesn't the estate have a responsibility to determine who the heirs of this estate are, the beneficiaries of the estate? No, your honor, and, and uh, you know- the, no, no, wait a the, minute, wait, wait a minute. Then what is the job of an administrator? Um, presuming there is no will, um, wouldn't 
the fiduciary of the estate have the responsibility to determine where the estate goes? In other words, determine millennial descendants or other proper heirs well, of the decedent? Your Honor, I guess I'm trying to track what you said, presuming there is no will. There was a will here. So we I can't understand. Compare. But in this case, we have to determine who the lineal descendants were of the uh, named beneficiaries of the estate who have died. All right. So you're essentially the same analysis. We have to determine who now are the lineal descendants who would take under this estate. And what I'm saying, Your Honor, is is if the if the court reviews the, the Fetchner case, uh, you know, they just don't they don't get there. Uh, and your honor, I, I, uh, uh, I continue to look, and this is why, where I wanted to get you to the, to the case law, some case law that I think is, that is relevant. You know, the, the Fatchner case, um, admitted that there was no, no case directly on point regarding exhumations. And, uh, but in my research, Your Honor, I was able to find a case that was similar uh, to this, but it was in California. But it's a, at least it's a published opinion. Uh, and um, so uh, that is uh, Home v. Superior Court MISCO, whatever that means, Your Honor, 187 California uh, App uh, 3rd. One two four three, uh, and that was a 1986 opinion, and I think this gets kind of the heart of, of this matter. This this whether or not the court has this responsibility or even can do it. I don't think you can do it, Your Honor. I don't give jurisdiction uh, over uh, Mr. Kennan. We're not here regarding Mr. Kennan's estate, and so in order to to take jurisdiction over Mr. Kennan. Mr. Kennan's going to have to be a party. And Mr. so Kennan's dead. You know I, that, Mr. Wales, don't you? Yes, we know that. That's the so very we're really talking about his remains. Does the court have the authority to exhume his remains to determine an issue which may be of controversy in this probate action? Isn't that, that... that's correct? And it does not. Okay. okay. And, and what Kansas authority are you relying upon? Well, Your Honor, the the case number there. one. The Fetchner case, number one, uh, you know, in my opinion, Your Honor, does uh, support uh, our our position for the reasons I set out uh, in the pleading that I that I filed. OK, and if you go through that closely, I mean, you'll you'll be able to see uh, what my arguments are. And the reason that I'm wanting to cite the the uh, the California case is because it further clarifies the argument that I think that the the uh, the court in Fessner was was kind of somewhat missing uh, because they talked in Fessner about the discovery process and and uh, how one of the parties had indicated that well you could do this as a result of. Um, you know, uh, looking at the discovery statutes and, you know, they specifically talked about 6235 and the problem there, your honor was, you know, under 6235, it's, uh, you can order a party whose physical condition is in controversy. John Cannon's not a party, never will be, can't be. As we all know, he's dead. So he's not going to be a party, and you can't use that as some type of a theory to 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 um, exhume the body. And I and the opinion in in the California case that I cited kind of does a very good job of of explaining why uh, you know you, you you can't do that and. So what it one of the one of the comments I'm looking at page uh, four of at least the opinion that I a copy of the opinion that I have, and it says that uh, uh, that in the absence of a statute 
applicable to the circumstances, uh, it, they can only uh, allow this to occur if there is uh, explicit authority given under the statutes. And just as in Kansas, there was no uh, inherent or apparent authority that the court in California found that any district court judge, uh, they call it superior court judge there, but same thing, uh, has uh, to, uh, to order uh, an exhumation. And, you know, as I said, the Fessner case admitted there was no authority uh, in, in Kansas in the case law or statutory law. And in my analysis, Your Honor, I talked about um, the statutes that allowed for exhumation, and they did in the California uh, uh, case, and they talked about the different statutes. And one of the statutes in California uh, was the, similar to the statutes that I talked about, which was how the family uh, has the right to control uh, uh, the, the body, okay? And so uh, the California statute that is similar to the ones that I referenced, the Kansas statute, uh, they said, while these statutes do not create a property right as such in the body, they do recognize the existence of a quasi-property right for the limited purpose of determining who shall have its custody for burial. Um, and, and they say that this statute grants the right to control the disposition of the remains of the deceased person to the descending order. And then it talks about the spouse and then it goes on down through exactly like Kansas does. And so they explain that, you know, the court doesn't have the right to override the statute and to tell these family members that they cannot protect their loved one from being disinterned at the whim of somebody else. Uh, and as I understand it from talking to Mr. Uh, Cranmer, that his parties likewise do not want this uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Kennan uh, essentially um, dug up, so to speak. Um, so, your honor, uh, so you don't have, and there is no statute that says that you do have just an inherent right just because you're a judge to say you're going to allow this to, to happen. You have to have some statutory or case law authority to allow that to happen, and there is none. Uh, also, in that case, in this, this uh, uh, Holmesby uh Superior Court of MISCO uh, in California talked about uh, the discovery statutes. Uh, and what they said was, is that uh, in a criminal case, you know, where there's, they're worried about, well, what was the cause of death or something like that, then yes, you know, the court's got the power to do that. Just as here in Kansas, I mean, we have a statute that specifically allows the court uh, at really at the request of law enforcement to exhume a body to determine the purpose and cause of death. Uh, and so they had that similar statute in California. And so the court in this case goes through the different types of things for which, um, you know, a exhumation could be done there. And counsel for Ms. Davenport doesn't go through and say, well, this is the basis. You can do this. You can, you can do an exhumation based upon this particular statute or this particular uh, case law. So they go on through, Your Honor, and um, they state, this is a direct quote from the opinion. It says, despite this absence of directly permitted authority, real parties, which were kind of the plaintiffs there, uh, proffer two theories in support of their petition for to request the exhumation. It says, first, they contend that the courts of the state have an inherent authority to order discovery. Well, you know, they find, while that's true, not in, in this manner. Uh, 
and they say more recent cases in California have made it clear that the courts are without power to expand the methods of civil discovery behind beyond those authorized by statute. And I would submit to the court, you don't have the authority to do that either. I mean, you're not the legislature, and so you can't say, well, this statute, 6235, authorizes something that it does not authorize. And so that's what the court in California said. Well, we, we have to be restricted by our statutes and our case law. And so they go on and they say, well, okay, so we construe these uh, authorities as meaning that in the area of civil discovery, the judiciary has no power to create or sanction types or methods of discovery not based on a reasonable interpretation of statutory authority. And I would submit to the courts that that's what would, would have to happen uh, for the court to allow uh, this uh, exhumation. Um, it goes on uh, and, and hits on some other points that I, and, and I didn't know about this case when I, when I wrote uh, my review of the Fetchner case. I just recently found this. And that's why I wanted to make sure you knew about it uh, because it does kind of go through that opinion. Uh, and so it says, um, that uh, there is a clear distinction between examination of physical as evidence, such as handwriting examplars, fingerprints, written statements, and the body of a human being, which, I mean, I think that's pretty much common sense. It says the former are susceptible of examination without the likelihood of outrage to the emotional feelings of the living. And I'm telling you, that's what you have here, Judge at least my client, um, and probably uh, Doug's. Uh, as reflected in our laws, our society extends more respect to a dead body than to other physical evidence. And I believe in Kansas, we do too. And I think that's why our statutes are written the way that they are regarding uh, uh, exhumation. And it says, given the extremely sensitive nature of the interests which are infringed when the remains of the dead are disturbed, we are reluctant in the absence of legislative guidance to extend the meaning of the phrase objects or tangible things to include in turn human bodies. So there they were trying to, you know, go under a, a different uh, discovery statute so you could get, you know, uh, the production of objects just like we have here. Um, and they said, no, uh, human bodies are not, uh, objects or other tangible things. So then they go to the statute that's very similar to the one that is being talked about here for the physical examination. And, uh, and they say, um, and, uh, and that section of their civil code was section 2032, and which, said, which permits the trial court to compel a party, a party or a person under the legal control of a party to submit to a physical or mental examination. And it says real parties cite no authority, just as here, uh, to support their novel interpretation of the words party or person to include the remains of a deceased person. We must construe those words in their order, ordinary and common sense meaning, which you know we should do here as well, Your Honor. Um, and so it says, uh, in doing so, we can only conclude that the legislature in enacting section 3032, which is the equivalent of 6235 here, um, contemplated its application to request for examinations of living persons, okay? And in the Fetchner case, essentially that's what they did. And the only reason in the Fetchner case you wound up with having an examination is one of the, the people refused to, uh, to submit to a DNA testing, which several of the of the family members there did in Fetchner. And and of importance, Your Honor, the body that they were wanting to exhume was the very deceased in that case. 
we're talking about a deceased who is not the deceased involved in this case. We're talking about John Kennan. We're not talking about Larry Holderman. And uh, so what they go on, what the court there goes on to say is furthermore, we so see no way the express terms of the statute, even if liberally construed, could be found to encompass the body of the decedent. And it says, this opinion specifically says, the corpse is obviously not a party to the probate court action, nor can it be considered a person. Which, again, those seem to be common sense to me. But that's the decision that the court made. And it says decisions from other ju jurisdictions side by the, again, they call them the real parties, but they're the plaintiffs here, as authority for uh, the court ordered autopsy do not convince us that we should alter our conclusion. And the reason was, is they were, they were citing cases that dealt with autopsies and exhumations from a, a criminal case. And so um, the upshot all, of all this was the court said, in the absence of express statutory language, the courts of this state have no legal authority inherent or expressed, expressly conferred to disturb the repose of the dead as an aid to civil litigants in their trial preparations. And that's exactly what is being asked here. And so uh, we believe that the analysis made by the home in the home by the Court of Appeals in the uh, Holmes v. Superior, Superior Court case really helps to explain, you know, the further explain my analysis of the Fetchner case. Um, and so, you know, if the court wants, I can go through almost line by line uh, my analysis of the of the of the Fetchner case. But I think something that is that is really important that the court should look at is you know the case law, uh, and and I and I, I I guess I have to kind of challenge counsel for Miss uh, Davenport to. Uh, explain why some of this case law doesn't apply. You know, if the court is wanting to address case law and look at case law and, and why this case law controls, uh, I can I can go through some of them. But what what I would what I would point to uh, initially is the Gross v. Vandenberg case. And it that case talked about, you know, trying to establish paternity, which is what they're trying to do. And what it said was that the obligation of a father to support a child, whether legitimate or illegitimate, ends when the death of the father, absent enforceable contractual obligations to the contrary. It goes on to say in syllabus number three, a non-statutory action brought by an illegitimate child against the punitive father, which we don't even have that here, Judge, uh, uh, to establish paternity and to uh, obtain support does not survive the death of the punitive father and cannot be continued against the decedent's personal representative. Well, how do you get around that? I mean, it's, <laughs> to me, Your Honor, that's as, as, as clear as, as can be that then they even talk about, in that opinion, KSA uh, 1801 and 1802. Uh, you know, so, you know, Your Honor, without going through every, every line of this thing, um, I think that uh, some additional language out of that opinion that, that is controlling is where on page uh, 405 of, of the Gross v. Vandenberg opinion, it's a 231 Kansas uh, case, 1982. And at the bottom of that page, it says, if the illegitimate child relies on a finding of paternity by the court, the decree of, the of paternity must have been entered during the lifetime 
of the father in order uh, to uh, be sufficient to establish a right of inheritance. And so here we didn't even have that. They don't even have that. And and in the in this uh, Gross case, evidently they did. Uh, but the point is, is this needed to be established before the uh, the uh, the death of of the father, and that that didn't happen. Uh, the Foley case, Your Honor, uh, that is that is also directly on point and in my opinion controls um, you know the, the the court here as well and the Foley case uh, I mean I, I guess I can't think of any case that is is more clear than the Foley uh, opinion your honor and in that case they were talking about uh, trying to get some genetic test uh, for, you know, to establish the paternity of, um, of the, this father. And what the court said was, is, well, wait a minute, we've got to look at, we've got to look at the statutes and the statutes back then, your honor, were, uh, the different than the numbers that we have today. They were 38114 and 38115, kind of the forerunner of 232208 uh, and 232209. And uh, so um, what that what that case basically said was is that uh, you know, I want to see if I can find this the language. Um, it says that uh, any any person on behalf of a child may bring an action uh, and it says to determine the existence of a father or child relationship presumed under 38114, well, there is no father and child relationship presumed under uh, 232208, Your Honor. Uh, and that was the, you know, the forerunner of, this was the forerunner of that statute. And so there isn't a, a basis uh, to, to, uh, to assert a request for that because we don't have a presumption established under 222308. We've had no hearing uh, to that effect as well. And so we, we then go to the second part of the older statute, which is still the same language. Um, and it says, or you can do a, a paternity uh, test you know, uh, at any time and confirm and file your paternity action at any time up until three years after the child reaches the age of majority. Well, that we've long since been been past that. And so that's the current 23-2209. And to kind of uh, bring this to, to a little bit more of a head, Your Honor, if you look at uh, the statutory requirements under 232208, and in particular section five, it says that a genetic test results have to indicate a probability of 97% or greater. Well, Judge, we keep coming back here, and this is the thing that kind of bugs me. We we come back and we say they say, well, we want to get the the um, uh, adoption records. I've been trying to get the adoption records from counsel and. I can't get her to agree on a protective order to let me see him, but hopefully that's going to happen. I'm, I'm sorry, Judge, I have to object. I have uh, drafted a protective order. I have sent it to Mr. Mills. He has not agreed to that protective order. I have told him that is all I'm waiting for. So I, I'm not going to have counsel misrepresent uh, that. 
Well, Judge, I, I will admit she sent me one, and it basically says I can't use it at the time of the trial. Not now, what if it she says, wants Russell. to state that I can on the record, then fine, I'll sign it today. But I want that clearly uh, stated on the record that I have the right to use that those reports and the contents of it, and that you get to see it, Your Honor, which I think she's now agreeing to that, uh, so that you can review Wait, that information, and so that I can argue it, and so that any counsel can argue it if they need to. But going further. Uh, so there's no, so then we have, then we have you order your honor. You say, well, if I'm even going to consider this, I'm sure you remember this, your honor. You said this, this, uh, uh test is going to have to be uh, a secure test. And, uh, I'll submit to the court that an ancestry.com test who we don't know, you know, uh, how this test was conducted. We don't know. Um, we don't even see Susan Davenport's name on it. We don't see John Kennan's name on it. We don't Your see. Honor. Your Honor, what are you talking about ancestry.com? What are we referring to here? Well, Your Honor, there is a, the very petition that we're here to talk about today, the one that counsel filed, has tried to attach a ancestry.com report as if it was some evidence of paternity. <laughs> and it is your, your, your honor i have to object to this i believe that mr mills is now bringing in potential nego potential settlement negotiation into open court um my, i was on that email your honor that miss williams sent and she was simply asking if that was going to be sufficient or not if the answer is no then we continue with the legal proceeding but it has not been submitted to this court as evidence, and it's not been presented at this moment time. Has it not been attached? To, has it not been attached, counsel? There is one page showing that I have attached that shows that Susan Davenport and Clara Lodima uh, Lodima Holderman's, who is the grandmother, who was one of the original heirs to this will, her brother Edward, are related as grand uncle and grand niece. That and is Honor, all that, that has been submitted. And that's, well, no, that shouldn't be submitted at all. You're, but, your your Honor, please, can we stick to the legal arguments that are here and not evidentiary? We're not here for an evidentiary hearing today. We're not well, questioning the evidence. And I haven't heard any legal argument that is relevant to the state of Kansas uh, 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 in this entire piece that we've discussed. And your frankly, the, the council has complained about the cost of these proceedings, but the clock has been running and we have not had any relevant argument based on what the court has asked for. So I just simply ask that counsel be required to stay on task. I would love to hear what his arguments actually are, but we are, we're, we're off in the weeds and we are not addressing this specific issue, which is whether the court will or will not be ordering um, a DNA test of the decedent um, that Johnny Kennan who, who has been asked to be dug up, Your Honor. I just ask that we Your stay Honor, on that task. Your Honor, uh, I appreciate counsel's comments, but I totally disagree with what he's saying. If he has some case law that can show you, Your Honor, that the Gross v. Vandlerberg case has been set aside, then he needs to state it. If he has some case law that says the Rickabaugh case should not apply, if he has case law that shows NRA MF should not apply, if he has case law that shows that uh, NRA uh, uh, EA should not apply, uh, uh, all of these, and if he has some case law that interprets Fetchner differently than I do, then let's see it. But it doesn't exist. If he can show me a statute, Your Honor, that says that there can be an exhumation Tell me what that statute is that allows you to do that. Because it okay, doesn't. Mr. Mills, doesn't Fechner, a Kansas case, leave open the issue of, of exhumation of a body? Your Honor, it is exhumation of a body as it applies to a party, not as to a non party. Okay. I mean, you. And that's why I, I wanted I don't to understand. I understand that you, you, council has stated previously 
that a, a decedent cannot be a party to the case, which I believe is an accurate um, description. So clearly, the person who was exhumed in Fetchner was not a party to the case. And while he's looking, Ms. Williams, do you have an interpretation, a narrow question here, of the Kansas Fechner case as it would apply to our current situation? No, Your Honor. Um, I have not uh, researched that to, to see if there's any further interpretation of that case law. So uh, that's something I would have to do. Your Honor, in, in, in looking at, you know, at, at the Fechner case, uh, you know, it the very first you know kind of bullet point that Fetchner says is you know that whether DNA evidence would be relevant. Well, you know, as I told the court, uh, when we first got the uh, information uh, from counsel regarding the the uh, uh, adoption, what we were told out of that case was that uh, Johnny Kinnon was not named as the, um, as the father and that the father was unknown. Well, if that's the case, Your Honor, then uh, how can that be relevant? Judge, I, I apologize, but I have to object again. That is a misstatement. It didn't that say is not a misstatement. Just a moment, Mr. Mills. The birth certificate did not say that the father was unknown. It said the father is not unknown. As you recall, and I know this is a, a couple months back, but I said it was something I've never encountered before and probably never will again, but it specifically said he was not unknown, but it didn't give his name. Your Honor, so, okay. That could be anybody, any man alive back then, I guess, could be the father. So, I mean, that does not show that this would be relevant. No more than my a test for me would have been relevant. So, you know, uh, I, I, I really suggest that, uh, that, you know, the court uh, take time to review again my my analysis in in of the Fetchner case, but but to me, Your Honor, we don't even need to get there. I mean, if 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 there was some if there was some case law that overrides Foley, what is it? What is the case law the, the case law that overrides the Foley opinion? Why is you Foley know? controlling? Well, because Foley is talking about, uh, you know the request for um, a, a, a determination of paternity. And what Foley said was genetic test results, presumption of paternity must be known, must be known uh, under the Kansas Paternity Act prior to the death of the of the alleged father if you want to enforce a support obligation well correct no your honor i mean no that if you look at the statute it doesn't say anything specifically just about support it talks about determining paternity and well, so here's here's what bothers me mr mills more than anything isn't really our task here to seek the truth don't we need father, to determine the, truth to here? the law it's our task to follow the law that's what I would say. Okay. And, and, and what and Kansas so, law precludes an order in the probate court, a court of equity, from ordering, I, I think undesirably, but necessarily, the exhuming of this body so that we can determine the truth. The one thing that it strikes the court that's desirable about doing so, despite the grisly and intrusive nature of this, is that DNA testing could conclusively exclude Susan Davenport from being a biological heir of the beneficiaries of this estate. Now, whether that your honor, terminate that, her claim or not, I, I, I won't even begin to speculate. 
Yeah. But it and would I, eliminate her as a biological heir, would it not? No. What I would say, Judge, is Well, that, I, actually, I think it would. I, I think that okay. DNA testing well, can conclusively exclude. Okay. Uh, that and that would be desirable. If anyone oh. here has a fear of that, it should be Susan. If yeah, she is well, not, if she doesn't really have a good faith belief that she is a biological descendant, DNA testing could conclusively exclude her. And you know, but Judge, it's not her that's fighting it; it's her that's wanting it. I understand. Therefore, she's that. wanting it to establish that she is a biological heir, and that's the narrow issue before us. The uh, the administrator CTA has a, an affirmative duty to determine the biological heirs, the lineal descendants of the beneficiaries of this estate, because they're gone. The ones that were gone, but Your the non claims the uh, non lap statute kicks in and says then it goes to their lineal descendants in appropriate shares. So all right. we need to determine who those are. Okay, not? but what we have, Judge, is, I mean, I understand this is complex and it's kind of hard to follow, but but one of the problems is in some of the other cases, I think the Smith case, Smith versus Smith, it was determined by everyone uh, by uh, by uh, without question that this man was the biological father of this child but the court said that in and of itself is not enough that is that man who has to bestow parentage upon this child and he has to acknowledge that uh, under the statute that he uh, notoriously acknowledged that he was the father. So it doesn't even matter. I think the first thing that needs to be determined, Your Honor, is that issue. You know, and if we get past that issue, then maybe you do your DNA. But I don't believe that you, I think we're going backwards. We need to see if, if that in fact happened. Did he notoriously or in writing determine her to be his child under 22 or 23 2208 and because that would be that's... necessary to establish her um relationship to mr kennan under the kansas parentage act correct well sure it would be but but, but that's also... not the claim she's currently making she's not making a claim under the kansas parentage act she's making a claim that she is a biological heir in this case well biological. judge and what I would say, it's one and the same. There are no, it, even if they're even not, if because she, the statute itself excludes uh, or considers those as separate ways that she can establish that she's a daughter of Mr. Cannon. Her claim currently before the court is that she wants this court to uh, make orders that would determine if she is a biological descendant of, of Johnny Rex Cannon. You know, Judge, and, and, and what I'm trying to say is, even if you said, you know, I find today that she's the biological uh, descendant, I don't believe that's enough. Even if you could do that, which you couldn't, but even if you could, it's not enough. She well, has true, to establish yeah. paternity. That's what the statutes I'm reading say. Well, in Kansas, even children who are adopted out retain uh, the rights to inherit from their biological parent, do they not? They so do. there's no That's prerequisite that that parent who signed some adoption consent freely and knowingly uh, acknowledged them. I because agree. that isn't done in every case. That isn't true in every case. Uh, I, that doesn't make sense to the court that that's, well, that's a prerequisite to her being able to establish that she is a biological descendant in this case. Either she is or she isn't. Well, Judge, what I'm trying to tell you is in, in my reading of the case law, even if she were found to be by a DNA test, you still have another step. That man had to have acknowledged her as his child to establish paternity. And if you read the motion that that counsel had filed, it is, she admits that they have to be able to establish paternity in her very motion. 
And now we're morphing this to, well, all she has to do is figure out that she's the biological child. No, that's not it, Your Honor. It's got to be both. Judge, I, I don't and know that I claim that my other. client had to establish paternity. I'm not sure that's what was said or intended with our- Actually, history. she just needs to determine that she is a biological descendant Correct. of Clara. Correct. Clara is the name beneficiary under this will, not Johnny Rex Kennan. She has to determine if she is a biological descendant of Clara. And your honor, I guess what I would say is how do you how do you do that? I mean, how are we going to prove, how is anybody going to prove who the biological mother had sex with? I mean, if there were other uh, say relatives of of Mr. Bunyard, who she's trying to uh, bootleg in that report, uh, that had sex with her. Judge, could I ask going to be the court to caution Mr. Mills know. to be sensitive to the people who are listening to this, who are related, including my client? Uh, I've, I've asked Mr. Mills to be sensitive before, and he's he's doing it again, Your Honor. I, I would ask that we sure. treat the people involved with some sensitivity and respect. Your Honor, Mr. I'm just trying. I'm just trying to. I maybe I'm not as as sensitive a person as other people are. I don't mean any uh, to insult anybody with anything that I'm saying, Your Honor. But you know, I am asking that the court, you know, review the case law that I have provided and the statutes, and understand that this is a at least a two-step process, and and you know. A establishing that she may be related to uh, a great uncle or an uncle doesn't establish who the father was. And until you can establish the father, you can't prove that it was it it was through that chain, see, that 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 a child uh, of Clara was the, you know, or a grandchild of Clara was, uh, you know, was someone involved in this case. You know, if you say that the, that the great uncle, they're related to a great uncle, that does not necessarily mean that they are a biological child or grandchild of Clara. Okay, I'm not sure where the great uncle argument comes from. Well, for because them, the court doesn't have any great uncle DNA evidence before it, nor is I think that's even being considered. I hope not. I hope not, oh, Your Honor, because okay. it, it's just not relevant. Relevant. And but that's what they've been presenting. And so how are we going to establish, Judge? How are we going to establish that this child is the child of uh, re related to Clara. And I'm saying- Because you know, Johnny Rex Kennan is her biological son. Okay, so, I mean, the point and is- through the, are, through the chain, if if DNA testing is done on the remains of Johnny Rex Kennan, linked with DNA from Susan Davenport, she can be, I know she can be excluded what the percentage rate on being included is not clear. The court recognizes this, but I think that we would have some indication as to where she stands as far, as far as biological parentage is concerned. It is something that is available while complicated and somewhat expensive. We, this court is not aware of any other DNA sample that might otherwise be consulted or um, accessed. He didn't leave hair in his Bible or anything like that, that like some people have done in the past that might be used as a DNA sample. It, it's going to be an invasive intrusive procedure. This, the court recognizes Mr. Mills. I understand that your honor. And you talk about being insensitive to people. You're going to destroy their uncle's body, dig it up, 
throw their bones down to Oklahoma, maybe bring them back, maybe not. And, and my client and her and the, the family members aren't supposed to be upset by that because some Ill, uh, alleged, alleged daughter wants this done. How is There's that a certain fair, irony there? They're just or equitable to the family. If we're looking at the, the views of the next of kin, if she proves to be his biological daughter, she would be his next of kin. Now, I do understand that that is an issue in controversy. But the concerns of a niece over the remains of Mr. Kennan certainly is touching. But the court certainly would think that maybe she fears maybe the result of the DNA more than her concern over desecration of the body. And it's the, the court's understanding that this would be done in a professional manner with them to the extent possible with all due professional and scientific respect. And um, what you'd be doing is taking bone samples from the coffin, literally. Uh, we haven't even dealt with the issue of what would happen to those after. But that, that's really what we have before the court, Mr. Mills, and that is... I, I know that we're dealing today with the court's legal authority to make this order. Um, but it would be, in the court's view, helpful to have this information. Well, Your Honor, I uh, all I can tell you is uh, I understand the court's thinking, and I and I obviously re respect your analysis. All I'm trying to say is, as a lawyer, I have to make uh, legal arguments that maybe the court might not deem as equitable, okay? But, you know, as I understand it, you know, equity begins where the law ends. And if we have no authority that allows the court to make the ruling that it's making, then the law is, uh, uh, you know, you have no authority. And so, so, Unless you can have one of these counsel appoint, point to you this law that I can't find, then, you know, maybe that's what needs to be done. Maybe you need to see where this law is that gives you this authority. You know, uh, you, you can't use equity uh, to overcome the lack of, of uh, a statutory uh, approval uh, to do this. And just my concern, I mean, again, I, and I'm going back to cost. I hate to do that, but, you know, I'm going to have to, in my opinion, don't take this as a threat, Judge, because it's not meant that way. Uh, but I'm going to have to appeal that decision. I'm going to have to ask you to, if you do make such an order, uh, allow uh, me to, uh, to, to have the uh, journal entry uh, written in such a way that this, uh, would allow a uh, an interlocutory appeal of this decision. Because, Judge, you really, I mean, in fairness to you, I, I can't find any law that specifically allows you to do this. And short of that, I just don't know how you can order it. May, may, may I, Your Honor, because I think I can inform the court. Mr. Weiter. Um under the general provisions governing, governing discovery in Chapter 60, the court's scope of discovery is other unless otherwise limited by the order of the court in accordance with the rules of discovery. Parties may obtain discovery regarding any matter not privileged which is relevant to the subject matter involved in the pending action, whether it relates to the claim or defense of the party seeking discovery or any other party. I mean... It goes on and, and continues, but um, uh, th this, you know, the discovery statute that's being cited um, re repeatedly is about discovery that's in um, what would be compelling another party to um, to the to the case to submit to um, an examination. OK, um, which, you know, as as we know, probably is probably most relevant in, say, a, a car accident case where someone is claiming injuries the, and the party on the other side says, I want you to go in for an independent medical examination to determine this. And they say, no, I don't want to do that. 
And so then there are rules for how the court is supposed to interpret those. Those are the rules that are found in 6235. Okay. But we've established, and Mr. Mills has made clear that a corpse uh, or the remains of a decedent are not parties to a matter. The court can and has the authority to order discovery of any relevant evidence throughout this process. Um, I think Ms. Williams's request is appropriate. I think that the court's interpretation of the Fechner case is exactly correct. And that when that without the biological prong being completely separate, other than as interpreted um, in the Fechner case, it is without, uh, if we were to take Mr. Mill's interpretation, it would have no actual basis. And it would completely cut out the fact that in under Kansas law, adopted ch or children who are adopted out by their biological parents may still inherit from their biological parents. They may never have known there is no requirement that the KPA is the only way to determine parentage. There are three ways, as the court has illustrated. One of those is biology. And there's ample case law in the state of Kansas that um, a DNA test can give near certainty for parentage in this circumstances. And so I don't see any, Mr. Mills is asking for, for us to show where you have direct authority to do this. And of course, it doesn't say that you have the authority to order an exhumation in the statute because this, but it does say you have the authority under the, um, rules of civil procedure, which are incorporated into the probate code for the purposes of discovery only, it gives you the ability to order any um, discovery of any relevant evidence. And, and I think that's been clear from the very beginning. And I understand that Mr. Mills's client and frankly, Doug, Mr. Cranmer's clients do not want this evidence to be presented to the court because Frankly, I agree with the court's assessment. I think they fear um, that Miss Williams' client will indeed be named um, a lineal descendant of Clara Holderman. Um, but I mean, again, we fall back to the circumstances from the administrator CTA's perspective. We believe we have to make this determination um, that that there is no there's no flexibility for us. And so we're simply asking the court to make a ruling one way or the other um, so that we know how we can administer this estate. Um, and and so again, I, I believe that it's there. And I believe that the, the wealth of the case law that's been brought about regarding the Kansas Parentage Act applies to a Kansas Parentage Act claim, but that is not the claim that's being made. Um, Mr. Mills has asked to the court to interpret this claim as if it were, or to apply the Kansas Parentage Act case law to the biological prong of the test. But I believe that that is inappropriate. And I think that the court, when looking at solely the biological prong of this test, has the authority to determine, um, determine by blood, and frankly, by a blood test, that that's the case. And you know, if if there is a concern with um, um, digging up the purported father of Miss Williams' client, um, as the court has identified, um, this really turns on Clara, um, and, and her DNA could also be tested, frankly. Um, but I think the circumstances here, um, the best DNA test would be for Johnny Kennan to be the one who was tested, because I don't believe anyone has argued that Johnny Rex Kennan was not Clara's son. And so uh, Miss Williams through Miss Miss Williams's client through counsel has asked for what seems to be the best potential evidence we can have to make this determination. Um, and I think it's a reasonable request given the circumstances. Um, and 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 frankly I, I I think we've we've all seen Mr. Mills's arguments. Um, um, we, to the to the extent that there are additional cases that he would like to cite, I would love to actually have actual citations of those cases. Um, but um, the 
mostly he is retreading arguments that have been made in the multiple filings that he has made on behalf of his client up to this point. Um, and frankly, um, from the administrator CTA's perspective, there is a significant amount of irony that an argument regarding cost is being made given the sheer number of filings on the same or similar circumstances that have been filed in this case um, by the parties making those claims. Um, because every time one of those gets filed, each of the parties involved has an ethical obligation to review those and determine if a response or other um, action is necessary. And it has increased the time and effort involved in this case su substantially. And so, frankly, I would ask the court to make a ruling either for or against so that we can move forward with the next step, because we can sit here and yell about this <laughs> until the cows come home. But until until unless the court has made a ruling on whether Miss Williams client will be allowed to um, conduct this exhumation, um, we, we're stuck and it and we can have as many of these hearings as we'd like. Um, but we're not going to get any further down the line, down the, the path to determining who the beneficiaries of this estate are. Judge, no, no, no. I if would you... agree with Mr. Weta's arguments. I would adopt them myself. And I would point out to the court, I think significantly, that there is no law, no statute prohibiting the court from making an exhumation order. Uh, in fact, this is so common. It's my understanding from the mortuary that there's just a procedure. As long as there's a court order, they report it up to the Board of Mortuary Arts, and that's all that's required. So I think the court is well within its uh, uh, scope of, of duties uh, to order this exhumation. And quite frankly, we make this request uh, regretfully because we have tried to show proffers to try to cut down the expense, cut down the need for an evidentiary hearing, where we bring in all these witnesses that he held her out notoriously as his daughter. We've tried to show some DNA evidence to counsel. We were just kind of backed into a corner where we're not going to be allowed to make our claim, uh, I think is the whole idea that uh, opposing counsel has. And my client has a right to make this claim. She was adopted. She has shown that she has connections to Johnny Ritzkinen, and she has, she should be allowed to make her claim, and judge, this is the only way we're going to get clear evidence, it's the best evidence, so we'd ask the court to go ahead and order the estimation. Judge, if I could just respond briefly, I, I want to read this into the record, because I think Fetchner is being terribly misquoted here. It says when factual questions about paternity, and that's what we're talking about, Judge. You can spin it any way you want, but we're still trying to say that Johnny Rex Kenyon fathered this child, and that's why there would be a biological connection. Are contested in a probate proceeding. The Kansas Parentage Act presumptions for determining paternity is set out in 23-2208 apply. Whether or not any of the parties in the probate proceeding would have standing to be a separate parentage uh, act case to bring a separate parentage act case. So they're saying you have to look at the parentage act and they're saying you've got to look specifically at 23-2208. So we don't just get to disregard that even under the Fetchner case that they keep trying to, I think, misquote. And, uh, and I would encourage the court to read that opinion itself and if it believes that I'm mistaken, then certainly, Judge, you can you can you're you can make whatever order you want. But I disagree with the interpretation that counsel have presented. I don't think it's it's you would just have to totally disregard the statute regarding who has control of the body. You'd have to disregard, in my opinion, the reading of the Fetcher case that's appropriate. You'd have to disregard every case that I've cited to you where the court has said in paternity. Now, I agree it's in paternity uh, determinations, but when Fetchner says you have to look at the paternity statute, then you can go back and look at the paternity cases. And the paternity statutes in 23-2209, just clear as a bell says, if there's not a presumption under 23-2208, then the statute of limitations essentially is run. 
and you can't violate the statute of limitations and say it doesn't exist. That's my point I'm trying to kind of get to in a nutshell here. And it, to me, that seems to be fairly simple. And, and if, if the court wants to disregard it and say that I'm wrong, okay, I, I'll, I respect your opinion. But I also may have to very well go forward and appeal. Thank very you. Well, Mr. Mills. Counsel, are you available at 2.30 p.m. today? Uh, me or uh, all, all of us? you? Okay, yeah, I'm I'm available, Your Honor. Mr. Weta? Yes, I could be available, Your Honor. Ms. Williams? Your Honor, I am not sure. I have court this afternoon. I know I will be available later, say around 4 p.m., uh, but I don't know that I'll be available at 2.30 I need to look. I, I have a 330 uh, case, it looks like, and I want to see what I'm getting into there. Mandy, I don't even have a copy of the motion that was supposedly set for hearing at 330. What is it that I'm scheduled to be hearing? Please come on with audio. I, Judge, I would have to go pull that and see. Okay, because it's it's not part of the paper file. And we are behind on it because right. of the case management system shutdown. So um, I, I just don't know if I'm going to be available at 4. Ms. Williams, I know I'm going to be available at 2.30. Your Honor, do you anticipate just a short... Yes. I, okay. I want to make my ruling today, Counsel, but okay. I, I want to consider the California case law that was cited today. This is new case law. And it apparently deals with similar issues. And I'm interested in that court's rationale, as explained by Mr. Mills. Uh, what is the name of the California case? The 187 Canap Cal App 3rd. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's write that, Your Honor. Where'd I put it? Okay. I'm going to have to do a Westlaw search for it. Yeah. What's uh, the name of the case? Yeah. Your Honor, it's, it's Pamela Karen Holm H. O L M. All right. Thank you. Vers yeah. Versus the Superior Court of Sacramento County and Lisa Misco, M I S C O. Okay. I think that's correct, Your Honor. All right. That would be the intention of the court. I, I want to review that specifically before I rule. Uh, and um, Ms. Williams, again, 2 30. We can't count on you. Well, I could try to step out. Uh, I just wouldn't be able to be here with my client, so I'd have to give her the link to join by her own phone. Your Honor, I just want to make sure you have the, the correct site, uh, and I I'm, may not have heard correctly, so I show it as 187 uh, Cal App 3rd, 1243, a 1986 case. Is that That's what you had that? cited earlier. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right, Ms. Williams, if, if you can be here or a substitute attorney on your behalf, um, I would like to try to work toward issuing the ruling at 2.30 p.m. We'll use the same Zoom invitation numbers same as we link. use for this hearing. Okay. And then I'll see counsel back um, at 2.30 p.m. today, and the court will attempt to uh, uh, announce its ruling regarding the uh, issue currently before it. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Yes. Thank you, counsel. Go get some lunch. All right. Yes. Uh, Susan, no. if you'd go ahead and mute yourself, please. If you can. This is in the District Court of Butler County, Kansas. The court, again, calls the case of in the matter of the estate of Larry Holderman. It's Butler County case number... 2022 PR 168. Mr. Mills, Mr. Weta, Mr. Cranmer, and Ms. Williams appearing as before. I also note the continued presence on this segment of the Zoom proceedings that Susan Davenport uh, appears separately from her lawyer. Uh, this uh, matter comes before the court at this time for ruling on an issue uh, that's before the court, whether the court should approve the request for an order to exhume the body of, of Johnny Rex Cannon and do comparative DNA testing. 
Your, your honor, before you rule, could I be allowed to make a couple of comments? I was I didn't get a chance to say anything before. Well, Mr. Kramer, I, I really question about your standing and, and I, I didn't really overlook you except for the fact I noticed that you were on the meeting, obviously, and I do know who you represent, but you represent disinherited heirs. And once the court has made its ruling regarding reconsideration, and the court's not going to change its earlier ruling of disinheritance, I wonder whether you really have standing to be addressing the current issue before the court. But you may address that, Mr. Kramer. Okay. I I think I do, certainly to the extent of the exhumation of the body, uh, I think I have to appeal your decision with all due respect to the court. And, you know, it's one of the toughest things as an attorney to tell a judge I'm going to take an appeal. Um, but when you're talking about exhuming a body um, and going to the expense of maybe the estate having to pay for that, I do think that I have standing to address at least that issue because um, if I would be successful on appeal, then Susan Davenport's um, relationship to the to the decedent in this matter is totally irrelevant and that'll be and I've read all the filings that have been made you know somewhere between ten to fifteen thousand dollars to exhume the body and re-put the parts in the ground and do all the testing and all that and, and if the estate spends that money that money's gone and it may not be for anything that's has anything to do with uh, this case, it certainly didn't benefit anything if I were to win the appeal on my theory under the Strobel case. So I just wanted to briefly state for the record that um, my clients are opposed to the exhumation of the body. The Holm case that, that Mr. Mills cited to everybody pretty well sets forth the position of my clients with regard to the exhumation process. We don't believe Fetchner's relevant because in that case, there were existing DNA samples of the decedent left over from apparently an autopsy of, of the body. Uh, and the order was for a uh, purported heir to submit his own DNA sample to be tested against the decedents. We didn't even reach the issue of exhumation of a body in that Fetchner case. So while there may be authority to, to do DNA testing under the Fetchner case, uh, it certainly doesn't go to the exhumation of a body, which we believe is a step well beyond just DNA testing. Um, and again, from the pr practical standpoint, if the court orders an exhumation now pending an appeal, um, and the I went on appeal, that money's out of the estate, and I don't know how it would ever be recouped. So I'm not going to go read argue any of the other points that were made by counsel earlier today. I just wanted to add those points. Very well, Mr. Kramer. Court uh, uh, notes your comments and has considered them. Thank you, Your Honor. This court has considered the California home case cited by Mr. Mills and Mr. Kramer, but finds that the ruling in that case clearly turned on interpretation of California law principles, and that case is rejected as persuasive authority in this present action. Rather, this court finds persuasive, though not controlling, the Ohio case of Alexander v. Alexander, a case with many similar characteristics as uh, to the present case. Court will just read some excerpts from that Ohio case, and that is 42 Ohio Miscellaneous 2nd, page 30. Again, reading uh, excerpts that the court believes to be pertinent. As evidenced by the recent United States Supreme Court decisions, as well as the Ohio Supreme Court decision in White versus Randolph, the bottom line to denying an illegitimate child equal inheritance rights is that there is a substantial problem of proof of paternity, especially after the alleged father is dead. Today, however, we are entering into a new era area. Science has developed a means to irrefutably prove the identity of an illegitimate child's father. No longer are we dependent upon fallible testimony nor are we concerned 
that the decedent cannot be present to defend himself. The accuracy and infallibility of the DNA test are nothing short of remarkable. We live in a modern and scientific society and the law must keep pace with these developments. Historically, we have seen a steady progression in attempting to afford equal protection and equal rights for illegitimate children. The problems of proof which have been the basis of denying inheritance rights to illegitimate children have been removed by the advent of this new genetic testing. Therefore, this court can no longer be a participant in denying the opportunity to an illegitimate child to prove his paternity so that he may rightfully share in his father's estate. The holding in that case is that the child born out of wedlock who sought to inherit from his putative father's estate could prove his paternity by genetic testing and probate court could permit disinternment of putative father to affect such a test. Court does note in this case that it was um, apparently the father's estate that was being administered rather than some other uh, uh, heir or, or family member in the case. Uh, but the court does not uh, see that the difference is determinative. And it's a difference in the view of the court that does not make a material difference. This court has also reviewed the Kansas Fechner case cited by Mr. Mills and determines that the Fechner case clearly holds that a district court may order genetic testing to determine paternity in a probate case, even though no paternity action had been initiated prior to the purported father's death. This court has considered KSA 23-2208 and while finding no statutory presumption factors applicable here, the inclusion of Susan Davenport as a daughter on Johnny Rex Cannon's headstone alone creates, in the view of the court, a good faith claim of possible parentage, which merits consideration of genetic testing. The court further finds that DNA evidence is relevant to determine if Susan Davenport is a child of Johnny Kennan and a grandchild of Clara Holderman. Court also finds that providing a sample from Johnny Kennan's remains, while undesirable and somewhat invasive, does not unreasonably invade any privacy rights or create a cognizable personal intrusion involving Mr. Kennan as he is deceased. And the need to reach the truth regarding Susan Davenport's parentage outweighs any legitimate and well-founded concern over the disruption of internment of a body, which this court does not take lightly. Court further finds that there is a reasonable possibility to determine a match or non-match between Mr. Kennan and Susan Davenport, given the current state and advances regarding accurate genetic testing. Court further finds that the determination of whether Johnny Rex Kennan is Suvin Davenport's biological father would not adversely affect existing family relationships and would be consistent with Susan's best interests. This court finds good cause and exceptional circumstances that would justify the exhumation of Johnny Rex Kennan's remains and removal of bone material sufficient to conduct DNA testing. And this court so orders, consistent with the order previously proposed by Joy Williams on behalf of her client. Ms. Williams, I don't know if you see, based on the court's additional rulings today, the necessity to add findings to your order. Your original order was actually very concise and well-drafted. I give you credit for that. Thank you, but sir. There, but if there, if you do intend to try to submit the same order, I do have some proposed changes, which are okay. relatively minor. Do you have that order before you? I do not judge, but I can take notes and, and fix it when I get to the office. All right. In the second line, you meant you mentioned that the matter came before the court on December 1 of 2023. 
you need to add and January 19, 2024. Okay. And then on your whereupon in the next paragraph, whereupon on January 19, 2024, the court essentially made its ruling. Okay. You'll add that date. In that okay. same paragraph, I would like you to state that the court announced its rulings and made the following findings as supplemented by the record made on that date. Court announced its ruling and supplemented. And makes the following findings as supplemented by the record made on that day. On page three of your, well, no, I don't think I need to make a change there. Uh, Mr. Mills had earlier complained that the court had not entered an order dismissing his or ruling on his petition to dismiss claim. But I do see on page two where you state the court denied Mandolin Holderman's petition to dismiss claim. Yes. So I think you've already covered that. I don't think we need to have a separate uh, line for it. And then at the very end, Ms. Williams, it states the administrator, it's actually administrator CTA, but uh, is hereby authorized to pay costs invoiced by all third parties pursuant to the above order, but I'd like you to add up to the total amount of $12,150, which is, well, that was your aggregate amount, Ms. Williams. Right. Then I want you to have this yes. statement added. Any amounts above $12,150 must be submitted to this court for approval before being paid. Okay. Because I, I would hope that maybe the cost will come in less than what you had submitted, right. but if they come in more, I I, I want to know why. Okay. And I just want some pre-approval. And then if you go ahead and just put my full name under, uh, you're going to need to submit this by e-filing at this point. Okay. So I include the language, uh, this order is effective uh, on the date and time reflected by the electronic file stamp, as you did before. Okay. And then go ahead and just put my full name, David A. Ricky judge of the 13th district court. Okay. Your Honor, can I just get a clarification on your order? Um, you may. The, the, uh, the, the question that I have is, is that as I read the order that she has done, it doesn't say anything about Ren, uh, 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 putting the bones back in after they've been, uh, examined in, uh, in Oklahoma, uh, and put back into the grave. Is that going to be an expense that, that will be allowed? Does anybody wish to be heard on that? Your Honor, I, I think- I, I don't intend, I'll just tell you, counsel, I don't okay. intend to authorize that or direct that be done. Um, you're disrupting, the, essentially the burial site a second time to return it. And I, I just don't see the purpose. Um, if you if you have strong feelings one way or the other, please let me know now. I don't think that that was contemplated as part of the original cost estimate. No, it, if, it if they can get it done for the same cost, I, you know, I don't know what anybody else feels like we should do. I think it's a lab sample at that point, and they would usually destroy that in a, in a proper and professional manner when they're done with it. Um, it wasn't the intention of the court to direct that that be done. And I think that if there's going to be additional cost involved, that's likely to throw us over the amount that the court's already pre-approved. So I agree with that, Sean. Okay. But Can anybody see that that's a necessity to be done? I, I, Honor, I, have, to talk, I have talked to my client, but I, I doubt that's going to be an issue. But I'll have okay. to talk to him. Okay. Honor, I, all I can tell you is my client would prefer that it be done. Uh, she would have liked to, her uncle's body not to be disturbed. We understand your order, though. But she would like to see the body put back together, if at all possible instead of part of him being destroyed in Oklahoma. 
And your honor, I think on behalf of my clients, uh, Pearl and, and Frank, we would like to see the, the body parts returned. And I understand that probably wasn't part of the con, uh, the initial cost analysis submitted by Ms. Williams, but um, I think they would like to see anything returned back to the grave. So much so that they would want to pay for it? Well, be a cost, we would believe, I guess, under your order, be paid through the estate. Well, except that I'm not making that order currently. Well, I understand. But I'll have to speak with them. I didn't talk to them in that detail about, about that specific, the cost of it. I assume that would be part of the cost of an exclamation, be returning the remains to the gravesite. Perhaps this is something we should talk to our clients about and find out if there is an additional cost. If so, how much? Uh, but at least this order will get us to where we can move forward for now. That would be my suggestion, court Judge. Yeah, and I think you'd have to have some sort of estimate of what is it going to cost to reopen this grave, right. uh, open the vault and casket again, and then have these bones replaced. Uh, into the coffin itself. Um, I would think it would be similar to what it was on the front end, but I think that there would have to be a cost estimate before the court. I, that's just one of the factors the court would have to consider. Um, we're not trying to show disrespect to the body. This has just been a necessity in the view of the court to do. It's, again, it's not something I I necessarily favor doing, but under the facts of this case and the contentiousness of the parties, it appears to be the only viable option. So again, I, I think yeah. that th we'll hold any ruling on return of the the bone samples at this time, uh, pending further hearing. Your Honor, uh, one other question I need to clarify. Counsel, uh, Mr. Cramer talked about appealing as the as the uh, is there going to be a stay uh, entered as to the the uh, actual performance of the of this until such time the uh, he can get his appeal on file and that's determined? I also would like to find out whether or not this is a final order uh, that you deem appealable at this time, because we may very well want to appeal your your ruling as well. During the course of civil litigation, Mr. Mills, many orders are made which are not going to be reviewed later. In the views of some people, that makes it a final order, but in the view of the court, it doesn't. Until there's a final determination of issues in the case, which very well could be documented by the uh, journal entry of final settlement in the case, uh, I don't think anything's final in this case yet. There are a number of issues that this court has had to decide which may be grounds for an appeal. Um, for this court to authorize an interlocutory appeal, this court would have to make a finding that that interlocutory appeal would materially advance the ultimate termination of litigation. And I don't see how allowing piecemeal appeals is going to bring about a material advancing ultimate termination of this litigation. We still have other issues. Yeah, your honor, that's I, still yet to be decided. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh I I do. But I mean, once once the uh the body has been disturbed, it's been disturbed. It's not like you can put it, I mean, as if it didn't happen. So, you know, uh it's final once it's been done. Uh <laughs> so there's no like I said, redoing it, uh, you know, the, the body. Have you researched this issue during the pendency of a probate case that there's I, this type of ruling? Well, no, Your Honor. I mean, it's the first time this has ever came up, and at least in my practice. And so I, all I can say is, is we, if it's something that can't be, you know, set aside or changed by the court, the Court of Appeals can't say, you know, Your Honor, that you were mistaken and you never should have authorized that uh, exhumation. And then the exhumation's already been done. It's now it's moot. I mean, there's really nothing for the court. Why would the Court of Appeals even take it up if it's moot? I wouldn't. I mean, so it seems to me that 
that's really stopping us from even filing an appeal if it's a, it's a moot uh, issue anyway. Well, uh, I think maybe that's for you to determine, counsel. If you believe that this is a final order, which is subject to appeal, you can appeal it without any action from this court. To the extent that you're asking for a stay, this court will deny it. Nor at this time is this court inclined to authorize uh, any interlocutory appeals. Again, the court would have to be determining that such an interlocutory appeal would materially advance ultimate termination of the litigation. And I don't see that happen. That appeal would not be helpful in determining the issues in the case. The parties aren't going to settle this, it would appear, until this issue currently before the court is resolved, and perhaps not even then. Only uh, then, I don't think, Your Honor. So... Uh, Court's not inclined to, at this time, authorize any locatory appeals or grant any stays. Whether you feel like you have a right to appeal what you deem as a final order, that'll be up to you. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Um, Your Honor, if I may, I have one just administrative question. Um, is the court, um, does the court have a desire for there to be um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, someone overseeing this process on behalf of the court or the estate. Um, um, I guess my question is, is do, do I or my client need to be part of um, this process or does the court have a desire to appoint I, maybe a special administrator to oversee um, this piece to, to have someone to report back to the court on the, on the proceedings or is um, are the, the specifics of the um, professionals involved enough? Well, Ms. Williams had taken the lead on this, and I presume that she will be involved in each and every step of this. Am I wrong, Ms. Williams? No, I'll be, I'll be glad to uh, initiate the exhumation if the court thinks that's appropriate or if the court feels that the administrator CTA should take the lead. I, I'm happy to do however the court feels is appropriate. Well, you've made the contacts with the various professional entities that will be involved in this case. Court presupposes Correct. that you and or your client are, are going to make sure that the process is begun and followed through on while notifying each attorney at each stage as to what's going on. Okay. I, I will be glad to do that, Judge. Yes. Mr. Weta, especially. The administrator needs to know what's what's services are being rendered and what amounts are being incurred okay furthermore unfortunately we we the court makes this ruling in the dead of winter uh yes. i don't know if there's going to be any weather related concerns about being able to um do the excavation um and the disinternment uh, under these weather circumstances i will try to find out in the next couple of days judge but I, again, Mr. Weta needs to be at least him. And in fact, I don't see any reason why you can't send emails to all of the attorneys involved in this case with each development or each stage of this, this process. That would be my it in your order, but, but when it's going to happen, I think they need to be notified of. And that uh, would be I, my I, I find yeah. I want to give further direction in, in this regard. There needs to be a neutral representative representing the estate when this is done. Um, how close you want to get to it, I don't know. But I would I would hope that this would be a relatively quick process. That wouldn't be a matter of all day or even hours. I think they would just set up the schedule. There'd be the excavation and it would be done. I don't necessarily think that you need to do it, Mr. Weta. I don't necessarily think Ms. Sullivan needs to do it, but I think there needs to be a designated representative approved by the administrator CTA to provide oversight of the actual excavation and exhumation of this body and the taking of the samples. Yeah, that that was that was my question. And and I mean, I'll be frank, I am OK with doing that. Um, <laughs> my undergraduate was in anthropology. It wouldn't be the first um, cadaver I've seen in my life, but um, I also wanted to make sure with with the idea that there are, um, are costs involved with my participation in that, 
while I agree, I don't think it will be a long process um, from what I know of, of an exhumation. Um, I, uh, I wanted to put that out there and basically have it either pre-approved for me to, to be present. I don't believe that my client has any desire to um, see a casket be opened herself. Um, but I, I frankly don't know of um, who would be a, a, a particularly appropriate agent to put in that same position um, um, in the circumstances. So, um, Is there any objection to Mr. Weta being the administrator of CTA's representative at the at the site? None from uh, my me and my my client, Mr. Mills. Well, I guess not, Your Honor. Other than it might be a little expensive having an attorney standing there instead of. I, I understand the concern. Would a uh, lesser than normal legal rate be appropriate here, Mr. Weta? Um, yeah, I, I mean, that obviously is at the court's discretion. All of my fees in this case are at the court's discretion. So if you think a lesser than, um, I, I, I think that, yes, I mean, I, I'm not using my legal knowledge in order to do this. So I do think that that would be a, a reduced rate would likely be appropriate. Your Honor. All right. Your Honor, I have one other question, if, if you don't mind. Well, uh, I want to address Mr. Cranmer first. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Doug? On the... I'm having Mr. Wetta at the excavation, you mean? Is that what you're I don't have any objection to that. Um, I could send, I suppose you could send the legal assistant out at a lower hourly rate, too. I mean, I don't have any objection to um, Mr. Wetta being out there, though. Um, that would be my standpoint. I understand the cost. I understand that, but I don't object to it. What is your firm's legal assistant rate currently, Mr. Wetta? Um, my paralegal that works with me on these cases is at $175 an hour. I'll authorize that rate. Thank you. You determine who actually performs the service. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And obviously your, your client needs to approve whoever's out there. Yeah. Your honor, the only, the only other question I, I wanted to ask the court was, and it kind of, uh, kind of ties in with what, uh, Mr. Cranmer was saying. Uh, if this testing is done and it's determined that uh, biologically Susan Davenport is not related, uh, is she going to be asked to reimburse the estate or what, what's going to happen there? Well, I, I think that that ruling is premature. Okay. Mr. Mills, we'll cross that bridge if we get to it. Thank you, Your Honor. You know, I have a question, if I could. Go ahead. Um, you made a ruling earlier today, uh, overruling my petition to alter or amend. Um, I do believe that's a final order in the case. I, well, I don't need to go into that, but are you going to reduce that to writing? Do you want me to prepare an order for that? Because that's when my appeal time would start. Uh, it was the intention regarding the two rulings that I initially made today to have my assistant generate orders, separate orders on each one of those points. Okay, thank you. That's what I needed. Thank but you. It's a, it's a good question, Mr. Kramer, and I'm glad you asked it. Thank you. But that's the intention of the court, and that should be on file probably within the next week. Your Honor, uh, to tie into that too, I had filed the motion to dismiss. I had filed a, a a motion for reconsideration of the motion to dismiss, and I I was under the impression you were going to deal with that. And uh, seems to me that we should have a final order uh, on both Mr. Uh, Cranmer's and mine, uh, such that they could be determined to be at least in our minds, uh, final orders as of today's date. Court will pre prepare that order as well, Mr. Mills. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Uh, Ms. Williams, is there any further direction from the court that you need at this time? Not at this time, Judge. Mr. Cranmer? Not at this time, Your Honor, other than the you briefly mentioned the question of whether I have standing or not based on your ruling. Um, am I still going to be allowed to participate or at least observe or be attending further hearings in this case? 
you'll be invited to the Zoom meetings, Mr. Cranmer. The level of involvement you will have may be limited. I understand that, but I mean, I'll at least- It's our to intention to keep you in the loop, Mr. Cranmer. Thank you, thank you. All right, Mr. Mills, anything further at this time? No, Your Honor, thank you, Your Honor. Or Mr. Wetter? Nothing further, Your Honor, thank you. Very well, thank you for being available for this ruling this afternoon, Council. Thank you. If there's nothing further, the Holderman matter will currently be in recess, and this meeting may be ended for all at this time. Thank, Thank you. you.